the things you guys don't really know about big sales, okay? I, I mean, honestly, the things you don't know about big sales. But what you do know about big sales is every time when we start the program off, what do we do? Big sales! Happy Friday to you. Happy Friday. By the way, it's Masters Week. I wonder how that sits with people today in the American sports landscape. How does Masters sit? Is it is it still a thing? I love watching Tiger Woods. I love watching Tiger Woods. I do. Now, for me, when I was a young kid, you know why I didn't really care about the Masters so much? Because they only had white guys playing it. I don't really care about country clubs. Okay? I don't care about country club sports. When, when somebody goes, Michael Phelps is one of the greatest Olympians of all time. Dude, that's a country club sport. Swimming in a pool at a club. Nobody in the inner city swims. <laughs> if they do, they're swimming over at Wildwood. What are you talking about? No, hey, Flexin, I watch Tiger. I don't really watch golf. I watch the majors now, and I watch Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods is a Caitlin Clark. He's a needle mover. He's one of the greatest needle movers in the history of American sports. I like watching needle movers. Here's who I'm polarized to. Donald Trump. Tiger. Steph Curry. The NFL. Mike Tyson. Who else? Caitlin Clark. Nobody really in the NBA. Well, Steph, baseball-wise, Shohei Otani. By the way, how about this? Shohei Otani? Best thing ever happened to him was the gambling. Best thing ever to happen on him and baseball is the gambling scandal. We got a villain. Fantastic. Fantastic. Saudis are involved in PGA. Fantastic. Polarizing. I love it. Bet you would have a different opinion of swimming if I ignored you drowning when I was a beach lifeguard. Well, do you know, Slagger? 50% of the world doesn't know how to swim? How could that be considered a sport? When half the world doesn't swim, who would you rather be? The fastest guy in a pool or the fastest runner on the planet like Hussein Bolt? I think the title of being the fastest man on the planet has more of a distinction than being the fastest guy in a swimming pool. And because he's white and he swims at the Baltimore uh, community uh, country club. I don't give a shit about those type of Olympic sports. Water polo? <laughs> Sorry, dude. Count me out. And if there's no brothers in the sport, I have no interest in it. I like diversity. I like the world competing in a sport that I'm competing in, or at least you have all races that can compete in my sport. I don't want to be in a beer-drinking league. Okay? What's the best Olympic sport? The decathlon. That's the best Olympic sport. The decathlon or wrestling? Curlers or athletes? Yeah, I do it every Friday at a bar at the end with my wife. No dudes. Told you about big sales and bards and dudes. It doesn't work with me. Drinking a nice Corona. That's my curling. You know what I'm saying? Michael Jackson is the definition of polarizing? Absolutely. Sure he is. I played water polo with George Allen's son. 
Who? Really? I'll ask him. Well, okay, who? Which son? Okay, which son did you do that with? I'd really like to know because I'm best friends with one of them. Okay? Bruce Allen? You played water polo with Bruce Allen. I don't think so. I don't think you played with Bruce Allen. Bruce is one of my boys. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll die for the birds. Of course you are. You've been on the show, dickhead. You bet you're right. I am friends with everyone. Damn right. I'm with you, Sills. Diversity. And if you have to play water polo, I think you sink like a stone. And I surely would. Hey, now, I know how to swim, though, because I had to do some stuff with my, with my grandpa. I mean, if it's not as if other races can't compete in certain sports, they choose not to. Or they don't have the economic means. Hey, Sam, do you think black communities have the ability to play hockey? Inner city kids? pair of skates cost 600 bucks. The pads, if you want to be a goalie or another 600, the mask is 150 bucks. The stick alone is $98. I mean, the gear underneath is another 78. The soft pads underneath the shoulder pads. You're talking about a $3,000 buy. If you want to be a goalie. Who's got that money? Hell, I didn't have that money when I was a kid. Traveling expenses. You want to know why blacks? There's not a lot of blacks in hockey. Money, economics, inner city, um, availability. A lot of that is by culture. Anyway, watching golf? No. Watching Tiger? Yes. That's where I'm at. Golf, yeah, hey, and hockey, crazy expenses. Just for green fees. Just for green fees. All right. Something happened with Tom Brady, and it was so awesome. Okay? It was so awesome. Did you hear what he said? The next great quarterback. The next great quarterback to win a Super Bowl. And challenge Patrick Mahomes. Who do you think he said? Say it with me. Say it with me. Come on. Say it with me. Who did Tom Brady say was going to be the next great NFL quarterback? Say it with me. Come on. Come on. Come to daddy. Come on. No, no, not Joe Burrow. The NBA sucks, dude. Thank you, 304. Your Mavericks look pretty good, though. Come on now. Come on. Come, come on, Steve. That's it, Steve. That's it. Come on. Say it. Say it with me. Tom Brett, come, come, come on. Say it with me. Josh Allen is going to be the next superstar to win a Super Bowl. I didn't hear that dude hurts, but I sure, I didn't hear Joe Burrow. I didn't hear, I heard Josh Allen. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Josh Allen. He's going to be the next one of the greatest talents I've ever seen. One of the absolutely sensational talents you'll ever know. All right. So you guys know. Big Sills is a man who likes to listen. And I listen to both sides of the aisle. My politics are different than some of the guests we get on. They are. But you know what I'm not afraid of? I'm not afraid of putting people on that have a different point of view. So today, three-time Super Bowl champion defensive coordinator, works for Fox Sports, 
and the Chicago Bears. Our friend Dave Wanstatt will join us. That'll be at 4.30. At 5.30, a man who held the chair at being the orator and the host of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd's going to join us. Big-time sports fan. NBC News chief executor, and he is the news director for NBC, NBC News. We'll talk a little OJ, Caitlin Clark, sports. That'll be at 5.30. The legendary Chuck Todd will be with us at 5.30. Sure you do, Sills. You know everyone. Yes, we do. And we get both sides of the aisle on. We'll get Ice Cube on. We'll get Chuck Todd on. Yes, here's another guy who's polarizing. I went to school with Chuck. And Chuck and I have been friends for 35 years. Do we see eye to eye? No. But see, unlike you, others don't form my opinion on others based on their politics or religion. I base my friendships on, you know, character. What kind of guy you are. Your politics or your political beliefs and your religious beliefs have no bearing on whether I'm friends with you. Zero. That's you and your own deal. My personal relationship with everybody is my own personal relationship. I've got people that have different views of mine. I know you don't. Many people don't. Hell, my daughter doesn't. I get it. I tried to tell her you should be open to everybody's opinions. But today in American society, unfortunately, you're closed-minded. Like BJ <laughs> or Dick Train or guys like that. Or guys are closed-minded. Nick Sirianni's the best coach on the planet. He's better than Doug. He's better than Vermeil. <laughs> He's better than Rexy Sexy Ryan. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. All right. No problem. I know where you are. All right. So we're going to have our friend Chuck Todd on with us at 530. Dave wants that. At 430, we'll get his thoughts. I think it is Caleb Williams now that we are going to see drafted number one overall. <laughs> okay. Sills can get everyone on the show except the people from the team he actually covers. That's right. It's been that way forever. Everybody on the planet comes on the program except the team that I cover. You know why? Because they're scared to be criticized. Buccaneers did the same shit to me. I didn't need them. Bucks did the same shit to me. I was on the flagship station of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You know what I called their general manager, Mark Dominic? A librarian. And all of his school teachers. 25 and 54 record. You think I'm going to sit on the flagship station of the Bucks and fucking lie for him? Not happening. I told you this. That's the reason I got fired. It wasn't the three monkeys. The Bucks had a hook to get rid of me. It's either he goes or I go. See, only I was on WDAE for 15 years. And they couldn't take it. You think I needed the Bucks to give me ratings? I didn't need them, BJ. You think I needed the Bucks? Or any of their guys? I never needed them. You don't like what you hear? That's a you thing. Sills, is, you're famous in your head. That's about it. Okay. Really? Then how do all these people come on my program? How do we get some of the biggest names in entertainment and in sports on our program? Why? Because they don't know who we are? Or our show isn't polarizing? I would make this point to you. There are, what shows get the guests we get on? 
Rich Eisen. Um, who else? The network shows. I do this by myself. I get up in the morning with no guest, and I call my friends. Every day, I don't have a guest when I get off the air with you. Man, I get Ice Cube or whomever. The Rock. You and Angelo are the main ones dragging the Eagles consistently. And the Eagles front office are the ones consistently dragging consistency down. Yeah! (laughs) Yeah! (laughs) Good mood today. You just should see me and Xander, man. I have the best relationship with a person that I enjoy working with more in my life than anybody else is Xander Kraus. I, 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 you know why? He will holler at me. I will holler back at him. We will bitch and scream. We will do this and that. But at the end of the day, it all comes from a place of love. I'm making the show the best it can be. That's the kind of relationship you want to have. Know where you stand all the time, dog. Not one of these. Hey, you know, uh, you know, we were just going to throw a pass up and hope we were going to get pass interference. Coach, that never happened. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, look, look, look at look at BJ. We've had one losing season in five years. No, you've had five losing seasons. You see how he sees things? He's had five losing seasons. He hasn't had one losing season. You've had five losing seasons. This guy takes victory laps for participation medals. Congratulations, you participated in the playoffs. That's a success. Okay. You're right, Sills. You took a back... Slide with Mark Holmes, but everyone else is great. I'm back. I can't stay away. Hey, Marshall. Hey, Marshall. Listen. Xander had some rules for you. Play along with us. We want you here. I want you here. Okay? And by the way, I actually like Mark. He's got the best interest of my show um, and the future of the show. He checks the show out because of you, Marshall. Okay? I don't want you to go. But come on now. Hey, if you get one of those wrenches and you get one of the opportunities to be part of the show, I'm going to respect you. You respect me. Is that fair? That's all I'm asking. Okay? I want you to respect everybody else. Hey, look, you could talk all the shit. No, not, I'm not asking you to, or anybody to change, actually. I'm not asking anybody to. I don't even mind what LJ's saying. Mark Holmes is a fat bitch. Okay, because Cowboy fan? Sure. Okay? Sure. Absolutely. Dude, I'm a creator of content. I'm not looking to sit around here and go, well, you know, that's not in the best interest of me being a friend with him. I'm like this. If Satan can make my show better, he's on. If I could have gotten OJ Simpson on my show, I'd have put his ass on. Okay? I would have. You know, the only reason I didn't put OJ on was because my wife said no. Probably my aunt, too, is the only reason I didn't put OJ on. Okay? (laughs) And he's right. I call Sills a bozo every day. Right. Well, get this. Unlike certain people you've had in your market, Josh Ennis, some people can't handle that. (laughs) Okay? So you would sell your soul. Um, My soul? For getting a guy on is selling my soul? That's selling my soul? No, kid. 
Selling my soul would be selling out my family or my daughter or my wife or my aunt or people that are invested with me my whole life, like my priest. Okay, backstabbing those people who have helped me, that's selling your soul. Getting someone on your program so that they can help your program grow is not selling your soul. I'm not ever going to be defined by this show or any show I've ever done. I'm going to be defined by being the type of father to my kid. That's going to be my testament. Not this shit or football or anything else I've ever done. God, if you're gauging me on that, what a shallow life I lived. I'm going to be gauged on what kind of father I am. Not by what kind of football player or talk show host I was. God forbid if anybody ever looked at me like that. What a loser life that would be for me. If someone ever did that. Internet was lagging. I zapped Mark Holmes twice. Seen Xander's comments and stopped. I didn't know trolling Mark was against the rules. No, it's trolling Mark is not against the rules. Okay? All right? Taking others' wrench. Marshall? Marshall? You know what you did. Marshall? You know what you did. Selling your soul is called pulling a... Oh, my God. (laughs) Selling your Sirianni. Holy shit, that's it. Selling your Sirianni. I enjoy your show, man. WIP (laughs) Zon. Sills, I enjoy your show. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. You're appreciated. Without you, there would be just kiss asses. I believe if we played like the Eagles, Cilio would have no problem giving the team their – absolutely. Get out of the way. Let the coaches do their job. Let the evaluators do their job. Let the coach have autonomy in the room, and you're going to win more Super Bowls. Absolutely. I erase his comments. That's all. (laughs) Marshall? Okay. You're important. Leave that to Xander. Oh, and for the record, so you know, I have no control of that shit. That's his call. He, he, look, he does that side. I do this side. He's on the other side of the mic. I'm on this side of the mic. All right. We're going to get into it here now. Yes. I'm, I'm in a good mood, man. Hey, I do like that. Selling your Sirianni. Hey. Hey, can I please keep my job? Jeffrey, what do I got to do to keep my job? I'm sucking a binky. What do I have to do? Sills Cataldi, best Philly sports heels. (laughs) Sills and Cataldi, the best Philly sports heel tag team. That's a tag team championship belt I would love to wear. Yes, sir, man. Cataldi and Silio. Oh, has a nice ring to it, too. Doesn't it, BJ? Has a great, great sound to that bad puppy. Hey, Sills, could Dak Prescott win a Super Bowl with Dallas? No. Can Dak Prescott win a Super Bowl? Yes. You know what I would do if I were him? I would look at a team like Chicago. And if this Caleb Williams kid, this pink fingernail guy, doesn't pan out Chicago or even Miami, ready-made, or even maybe Atlanta, go to a place that's got all the pieces of the puzzle. Don't go to some shitbox team like Carolina. The Jets, after Aaron Rodgers is done, that might be a place. He's not going to win a Super Bowl in Dallas as long as Jerry's running the team. He's just not. You know, Marshall, you can't come back after being in the – see here, Marshall, understand. Can I have my wrench back, Xander, please? (laughs) Oh, man. Hey, that may cost you a big-time super chat. (laughs) 
Hey, that that may cost you a big time super chat there. I don't know. We'll see by the end of the show how you behave, Marshall. We'll see how. And, and Marshall, do me a favor. Don't bend over too much, okay? I mean, you know, I want to keep this thing as professional as possible, okay? I don't want you to be like R. Kelly in the prison cell pretty soon with Diddy. Barber, barbershop quartet, don't bend over the soap. Don't bend over the soap. Don't bend over the soap. Hey, up over the soap. <laughs> oh, man. Jacob appreciates Big Marshall. We do, man. I was disappointed you left, dog. I'm glad you're back. Appreciate it. It's Prescott's last year with the Cowboys. If he doesn't at least get to the NFC title game. I appreciate it. Holy cow! Xander! Woo! That's a world record. That's a world record. Big Marshall. Okay, Marshall. Okay, Marshall. Even Big Seals. Hey, Marshall, hang on. You ready? Marshall, you're going to make me get on my knee? I don't know if I'm going to be able to get up here. Hold on. Hold on. What's somebody say? Shit, man. Marshall buying love? Come on, dog. You know you buy it every day down in South Philly, man. About 2.30 every night. Chicks don't take credit cards, dude. <laughs> hey, hey, chicks don't take credit cards. That worked down in South Philly at 2.30. Always remember that. Buying love? Come on, dog. What are you talking about here? <laughs> uh, right? Sills, what do you think Howie's next move is? I love that. We got a bunch of topics like we did yesterday. What? I'm going to write that down because I like that topic. What is Howie's next move? Okay. I like that. Besides Boo Thang. <laughs> uh, <laughs> back flexing. How you doing? Way to go, man. Holy shit. Big, hey, Big Marshall, man, came in, flexed the guns and said, give me my wrench back. Because now I'm going to start banging all you over the head with it. <laughs> Look at Marshall. Marshall couldn't stay away, man. I'm really glad, man. Really glad. That's really awesome. <laughs> hey, Xander just went like this. Hey, Marshall, um, we're going to have to have some um, guidelines here before we go on on the show. So, okay, you ready? This is my show. <laughs> uh, you can't. Well, I don't know. Maybe you can buy it. <laughs> hey, the, the the National Football Show, sponsored by Big Marshall. <laughs> hey, the big big sills. Hey, maybe what Marshall has just done for you guys, um, sills. Um, you know, uh, yeah. You're being a little too harsh on Howie. Um, and um, $29.95. Hey, Howie Roseman's really doing a really great job. <laughs> Thank you, Sills. Yeah, you know, Jalen, I think is top five, Sills. You say he's top 15? Hey, I really think Jalen Hurts is top five. <laughs> hey, Sills, I, I, I feel better. 39.25. Top three. I think Jalen Hurts is the top three quarter. <laughs> uh, oh, God. I think we've created a monster. 304. Dak doesn't have as much pressure as people think. If they don't resign him, he'll, he'll reset the market for a team that actually cares about winning. Um, I'll tell you, can I, hey, 304, can I tell you where I think Dak Prescott would be perfect? What do you think about this? Sean McVay and the Rams. 
How about Sean McVay and the Rams? He walks out of the building. They don't trade him because he's, he's they're not going to get any compensation for him. He walks out of the building. And Bob says, Marshall wants a golden shower. Oh, wait, wrench. <laughs> Sh uh, wrench. I'm sorry. Wrench. Wrench. Sorry. Wrench. Okay? Wrench. I meant wrench. Prescott's not to the Niners, man. They're going to give Purdy that number. Okay? How about Dak Prescott to the Rams? Right? Him to the Rams with Sean McVay putting talent around him. That organization wants to win championships. You got Puka Nakua. You got uh, Cooper Cup. They're going to continue. You got 11 draft choices this year. They're rebuilding the team. I, I, I like where the Rams are. Um, Richie, okay. He may not be done this year, but next. Really think that the uh, the Rams wouldn't move off of Matthew Stafford after this year? I don't know. I mean, for for Dak, I might do that. I might do that. Man, that forty nine ninety nine is all red and everything, right? My eyesight. <laughs> it's kind of throwing me for a loop. Don't, hey, hey, hey. Thanks throwing me for a loop, man. I see that red, that big old red dot right there, man. What does it matter what move Howie makes? Your old ass is just going to mock it anyway. Um, Damn, Sean. My old ass. How about your old ass way of doing shit? Same old, same old. Never gets old to you. The only thing that gets old is me and not the bullshit he pulls for you. And how he does deals? Why don't you pick one that actually matters to you? Me getting old or your GM doing the same old shit every year when it comes to your defense? You might want to look at that. How you doing? All right, let's get to the topics. I mean... Okay? Seriously, Sills, golf is free agent at the end of the year. I think they're going to get a deal done this offseason. I think they're going to work around between 40 and $45 million for Jared Goff. By the way, he's whining about – I didn't even know Detroit had media. He's crying about the Detroit media. What is Detroit tough media? I mean, I actually played up there for a cup of coffee. Detroit has tough media? That's not a place I heard that. I mean, Boston, Philly, Pittsburgh, okay, San Fran, um, right, right, right around in that, Green Bay, you know, New York, Times. I mean, Detroit. <laughs> I didn't know that. They had rough media up there. I, I didn't realize that. Our defense gave up 500 yards of total offense and won a Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, you had a guy out play Brady. That's why he won the Super Bowl. Are you suggesting that? Wait a minute. Who had a better Super Bowl? Um, uh, who had a better Super Bowl performance? Nick Foles? Or Jalen Warts, who had a, who had a better Super Bowl performance, Jalen Warts or Nick Foles? Who who had a better Super Bowl? <laughs> I, I meant Hurts. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say Jalen Warts. I apologize. Marshall, red dots dropping here. <laughs> here you go. Uh, supported the show, Flex and Daddy. Thank you. Hey, calm down, son. There you go. He's back to normal now. Who had a better Super Bowl? Jalen Warts or legendary Nikki Folds? 
Oh, oh, it, oh, it just happens. One guy won. <laughs> the guy who fucking won sells. Duh. <laughs> oh, so wait a minute. A guy who had a one game wonder and one year when he went 26 and two at touchdowns to interceptions and won the Super Bowl. Who's done more in his Philly career? Nick Foles or Jalen Hurts? That'd be Nick. Who would have thunk it? Nick Foles is a better Eagle quarterback than Hurts was. Oh, no. Oh, no, Dorothy. That can't be true. Well, Nick's one year he was a pro bowler, and he threw 26 touchdowns and two picks. And there was another stretch where he won you a Super Bowl. I mean, if I'm going to pick a quarterback that had more impact in Philly, it ain't Hurts. It's Foles. <laughs> I mean... It, that guy's going to have to do an awful lot to pass old Big Dick Nick. <laughs> Jalen played great, too. Scoop and score, baby. Scoop and score. That's his new moniker on his hat. It's not hurt season. It's scoop and score. <laughs> Foles is a legend. Dumb comparison. So wait a minute. Jalen's had one year. Foles had one year. Um, Foles had an insane two-year playoff run. What was he in two years in the playoffs? Two years in the playoffs. Let's see. Three and one. He was four and one. Let's see what Hurts is. Let's see. One, two, 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 and two. He's two and two. Interesting. So Nick was four and one in the postseason in two years. And Hertz is two and two in two years. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Your obsession with Hertz borderlining Diddy like. My obsession with what? A bad QB? No. My obsession is is that guy's not as good as you think he is. And we bring people to reality. He's not as good as you think he is. Okay? Even Tom Brady, Josh Allen, will be the next. Yeah! Nick Foles. How you doing, man? Imagine that. Nick Foles and two, Nicky Foles had a better two-year run with a Super Bowl appearance than what Jalen did. Ooh, hang on. I got to have a sip to that. Ah, it's Friday. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> That's some jet fuel. Gator Boy calls me a joke. Well, any guy with the tagline, Gator Boy, let me tell you something, what you are, guy. Irrelevant. <laughs> You're obsessed with him. I'm not obsessed with a guy who stinks. <laughs> Nick Foles is also better than Josh Allen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, Big Sales ain't drinking. Big Sales got a Coke this time. I'm not really a Coke drinker. Unlike BJ, who's a Coke snorter. <laughs> He's not. I shouldn't say that. All right. Let's get to the topics. I hate to do this. Here. Someone just asked, what's Howie's next big move? Here we go. I think you may be forced to trade Devontae Smith. I think you may be forced to trade him. As much as I love this player, as much as I think he's gifted with the talents of being the greatest Eagle wide receiver, you're not going to have two. Nobody in the National Football League has two $20 million wideouts. No one. Nobody. 
There's no, how about this? Nobody in the NFL has this. Think about what and how pathetic the Eagles are not believing in their quarterback. Nobody's going to have two $20 million plus quarter uh, receivers, a $10 million running back, and a $50 million quarterback. And by the way, before LJ gets his ass in a bind, I get the cap, but you still write the checks if you're the owner. The owner's got to see production. I don't give a shit what it does on the cap. If I'm paying $50 billion to somebody and he underdelivers, I don't want to pay him that. Whether it hits my cap or not, what's the point if he can't win it? So in four players, you have $100 million in four players of your $255 million salary cap. It's Name me a football team with a $50 million quarterback, and two $20 million receivers. There isn't one. I looked it up. You're going to have to pick one. And you really can't pick AJ because BJ's right. It's too much of a cap hit unless the Eagles want to eat that cap number. Someone has to go. Who is it? Ain't going to be the quarterback. Why? Because of what BJ says, his cap hits are not relevant. They don't hurt the team. It's just the op- It's just the optics of him not being a fifty million dollar quarterback. Okay. Okay, Matt. See it. Have a great weekend, Matt. Congratulations to you. Sorry, it was too tough for you. Um. Pick one. Someone has to go. Who goes? You are not going to have two wide receivers, even if you pick the fifth-year option up. That's $18 million. You are not going to have two wide receivers at $20 million. Nobody in the league does. Hold, no, no, no. Matt, name me a football team that has that dynamic. You will not have one of them. Pick one. Pick one. Who goes? Do you trade AJ and take the cap hit? Or extend Devante and draft a receiver? Take 22 and 53 and move up and get another wide out. Or get Bowers. And get a receiver six here, here. So you know, 65% of the last 10 years, pro bowlers at wide receivers were second rounders. Okay. AJ Brown's a second rounder. Devontae Adams is a second rounder. Cooper Cup, I think it's a third rounder. I don't even know what Tyreek was. All the top flight wideouts in the game were second rounders. Over 60% of the all pro or pro bowl receivers were picked in the second round or later. Bob, Tyreek Hill was a fifth. Shit, I think Antonio Brown was a fifth. George Pickens was a second. Still, since he's in the same position and is looking to move from T. Higgins, 
Hey, T. Higgins is not going to start the season on the Bengals. He'll be traded on draft day. Okay? Joe Burrow's the highest paid player in the league. The, oh, well, wait a minute. I don't know what Chase's deal is because Chase's deal's coming up soon, right? I think is Jamar Chase is still on a rookie deal. He, they might be, he might still be on the team. Okay. But the, but the Bengals picked up that option for Higgins. I think Chase is on that rookie deal still another year. Then the following year, he'll be on, he'll, he'll they'll have to decide on the option or extension. Okay? Talk about the dramatic of extending Smitty AJ will want a new deal. If he doesn't get one, he'll hold out. Hertz will be pissed off. That's a great Hey, hey Xander, put Sam Fleming up. I hadn't thought of this. Sam, you're on to something. Talk about a dramatic. Think about, hey, Sam's right. Hey, Sam, if you extend Smitty and you he makes more than A.J. Brown, is Brown going to hold out for a new deal? Absolutely. Absolutely. I hadn't thought that. You're damn right. Hassan Reddick wouldn't have held out. This guy will, because if you're bitching on the sidelines about targets, you're going to bitch about dollars more than you are targets. There is no question. That is an absolutely outstanding area that nobody in Philly has hit on. Very good, Sam. Sam, you're going to create chaos if you extend. Devontae Smith with A.J. Brown on the team. Absolutely. And then you're going to have infighting in the huddle. And then your lack of leadership at the quarterback position won't be able to handle it. This is going to be a complete disaster if they extend him. Absolutely. What a dynamic that I hadn't thought of. Way to go, Sam. This is why we have some of the best people that watch this sport and are fanatics with this sport. Cause I hadn't thought that I got to tell you, I think that is absolutely a brilliant take. AJ Brown can, will be the biggest cancer since Terrell Owens. Okay. He'll how many people, Hey, let's do this. Let's do this. If they pay Devontae Smith more money than A.J. Brown, how do you think A.J. Brown will act? Wait a minute. Ty brings another great point up. Smitty isn't close to A.J. Brown in skill set. Well... When Kyler Murray signed a $46.1 million deal, making $6 million more than Patrick Mahomes, do you think he was more of a skill set than Mahomes? Or was he the next guy up, as you guys like to say? Or Dallas Goddard makes more money than... Travis Kelsey. You think Dallas Goddard is better than Travis Kelsey? He's not. Goddard was the next guy up. McMullen said there will, they will not go over $24 million for this reason. AJ crying per usual. Well, then I'm not signing my contract if I'm Devontae Smith. I'm not going to not sign a contract for more money because I don't want a guy on the other side being a bitch. I don't want to play with that. Oh, wait, I have to take less money because he's a bitch? <sighs> no, thank you. What's, what is, 
AJ Brown's wallet and bank account have to do with me if I'm Devontae Smith. What what's that got to do with me? What what possibly could that have to do with me? If I'm fighting for my family and family's families wealth for the next 17 generations. Why do I care what he thinks? I don't care. And I'm going to sign a lesser contract because he's a bitch? Not me. And it, you get this. AJ will look like Terrell Owens. That's why he's AJ Owens. <laughs> look at this. Sills drunk as F today. Mark doesn't want to accept. You see what's happening here? You don't want to accept that you have a crybaby wide receiver who has to have things his way, targets his way, and hurts Jalen Hurts as a quarterback because of his attitude. He doesn't play championship football. The guy on the other side plays championship football. He doesn't. He's going to cry about money and targets. That's all he's ever done here. Has he produced? Yeah. So Terrell Owens produced in the NFL. What did he win? Dick. Randy Moss produced. What did he win? Dick. Great. Put up all those numbers. And guess what you were? You were the Kirk Cousins of wide receivers. Were you great? Yeah. But you refused to play. Antonio Brown even played championship football. He even played it. Brady got to him and connected with him enough to get him a ring. Antonio Brown has a ring. And Moss and Owens don't. Why is that? Because they only cared about their bag of money and their targets. Well, welcome to the world of Divaville. Okay? Anthony, if this situation comes to fruition, no quarterback would tolerate this. Jalen has no backbone to control the huddle or the wide receiver room. Anthony is somebody that I am starting to love even more because you know why? He probably disagrees with me on 70% of the shit that I say. But some of the things that he and I agree on are right to the point. Anthony, let's do this. They're working on a contract. That's what's being leaked out from Novacare, right? That's what's being leaked out. Here, how about this? I will, I promise you, if you convince me in another way, you know what I'll do? I'll go, you know what? I Somebody, Sam had that great take here. If they pay that guy more money, you know there'll be a problem. And get this. I think it manifests itself on the sidelines. We've already seen targets manifest itself. Game plan. Meltdown. Quitting on coaches. Quitting on each other. He could be as divisive as a player that the Eagles have had since Owens. Is that hyperbole over the top? Or do you think that he has the characteristics of acting like that. How about this? If the, Hey, think about this one too. Xander, think of this. How about if the roles were reverse? And Devontae Smith had the bag of money. How about this, Anthony? Watch this, Anthony. Let's do the roles reverse. Let's say Devontae has the money and the bag of money. And A.J. Brown was in line for a contract extension. And they gave A.J. Brown the contract extension. And they paid him a couple million more than what Devontae was making. Do you think Devontae would bitch and hold out? I don't. I don't. I think he has enough character to know he was just the next guy up. But A.J. Brown's ego won't allow that. He, he won't allow. Remember something. 
he left Tennessee and bitched at Tennessee because Tennessee came in $5 million under the market value. What do you think he's going to do if they pay Devontae three or four million dollars more than he's making? He's going to demand a trade. He did in Tennessee. Why wouldn't he do it in Philly? Why don't you go with the guy who has a track record of doing that? Right? A.J. Brown has a track record of doing that. Tennessee didn't give him the money he wanted in the market. You know what he did? He held out. So they traded him. You give Devontae Smith more money, he'll hold out and demand a trade. He's done it already. Look, hey, I honestly don't think A.J. would be mad. Marshall, he gets mad when he doesn't get the ball thrown to him. I mean, you really don't think. Trade A.J. for Marvin Harrison. You're not getting that high in the draft. You're not going that high in the draft. If that's the case, just keep A.J. and trade Devontae for max value. AJ's still a better player. Okay. That's the point. Pick one. Pick one. Okay. Xander says, well, AJ's still the better player. Okay. You're not keeping both. Which one? Bob brings a point up, and this is to Howie's strength. Sills, the other option would be restructure AJ, give him a bag of the current cap, and lessen the hit. This is where how yeah. Somebody asks, what's the next big move? It could be dealing with these two wideouts here. Okay? AJ was right, though, because Titans GM got fired for not giving him the money. No one's debating that. I'm telling you what the player did. No one's debating that. Should the Titans have given him the money? It's a different conversation. I'm telling you, once he didn't get it, he demanded a trade. It's not the point. And that is hindsight now. You didn't know that then. His, his career numbers in Tennessee were not overwhelming. He never had more than 63 catches in a season. And over 1,100 yards. It wasn't spectacular. It was Hunter Renfro-like. You make it sound like he was a superstar in Tennessee. He didn't have superstar numbers in Tennessee. Look it up. And the last year he got hurt. Okay? Still so seems so mad like this is a so mad, Ryan. Once again, Ryan. Okay? I get mad when my kid's not home. Or she's like, you know, having problems in school. I don't get mad at this shit. It's frustrating to watch an organization just constantly get in its own way. Okay? Um, he's a superstar, a superstar now. <laughs> Look at Corey. Once again, Corey is. Hey, Corey. Let me ask you this, Corey. Let's do this. Corey, you there? So A.J. Brown's a superstar, right? How many people think A.J. Brown's a superstar? Make a point to him here. And we'll do it again. Because obviously, 
Okay, no. A.J. Brown's a superstar. Is Devontae Adams a superstar? He's the highest paid wide receiver in the league. Devontae Adams. Um, who else? Stefan Diggs. Another $20 million guy. I'm really just going to go with the $20 million guys. Let's see here. We'll do, and I did this before for some of you, because I'm sorry for being repetitive here. Tyree Kill didn't have his big deal when he won his Super Bowl in Kansas City. So A.J. Brown, Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs. Um, and uh, by the way, Justin Jefferson is going to be a $30 million guy. So we're going to put him in there. He's getting his contract. What do these guys all have in common? All $20 million and never won a Super Bowl with that salary. Why have a guy like that with all these superstar wide receivers and you don't win with them? Can you answer that, Corey? You pay all these wide receivers all that money, and one guy won one prior to getting his money in Miami. How come big-time paid wide receivers don't win Super Bowls? Can you help me? <clears throat> Marshalls, I just can't see it seals those two receivers – Protect the Eagles' $150 million investment. Hurts. Why not just trade Goddard? Um, Goddard is not – dude, you're not going to – nobody has $20 million pairs of wide receivers. Mike Evans just signed his brand-new deal with the uh, Buccaneers. Was not a $20 million guy. Now he is. No $20 million wide receivers won a Super Bowl. Why have him? What's the point? Hey, Corey. What's your point of paying a guy? He's a great player. That hasn't won you shit. And you've won how many games now? 25 in two years? He got his numbers last year, and your team imploded. How can a guy have a career year at wide receiver and your team implodes? Your team implodes. He has a career year. That sounds about right. They demand targets, derail offenses, make them one-dimensional. You can't win with these guys. Agreed. Completely agree. You don't win with big money receivers. That's why. Get this. Here. That's why these wide receivers are all on numerous teams throughout their careers. Andy, Andy Reid agrees, too. So did Belichick. So is McDermott now in the Bills. They're going to find out. We're going to, hey, we're going to find out more about Josh Allen this year than we ever will about Jalen Hurts. At least you can do this. Well, if he doesn't win, there's nothing up there. There's nobody there. I mean, you, you, you have the highest payroll offensive huddle in the NFL right now. Counting your old line, there can't be a more expensive offense in pro football than that team. Think about that. The Eagles have the highest payroll offense in National Football League, and they have no Super Bowls to, to produce over the last two years for that. They got an appearance, which is cool. They got a Super Bowl and a nuclear meltdown. I'm not going to change my opinion on Josh Allen. He's a better talent. 
Sills, the Vikings aren't competing for a ring. Jefferson would be smart. Okay, hey, I, I would say this. If I'm Justin Jefferson, why would I sign a contract extension in Minnesota when I can get the money anywhere I want in the league? I'm the best player at the position in the league. I can get $30 million anywhere, and I can find the best situation for me and my team. I mean, why not, why not go to Houston? Okay? I know they just got digged, so that's probably out. Why not go to Washington? Washington's got a bag of money. You can go to Washington. Shit. In theory, you could go to Kansas City. They got the money to pay them. They got the money to pay them in, in Kansas City, but that's not how they think. <clears throat> Marshall, if you can shed light, how did the Colts handle two top receivers back in the day with Peyton? Just curious. Rams did it too, I believe. Marshall, the Rams never... Cooper Cup wasn't making that money until after they won the Super Bowl. Okay? They weren't... He didn't make that money. He signed that new contract after they had won. So there weren't a lot of guys making a lot of money at the Y and Z. Okay? Um, the Colts, back then, the wide receiver position was not the coveted position when it came to payroll. Back when those guys played, it was a different league. And remember something. The offenses back then... It didn't go through the wide receivers. Like Dick Vermeil said, when you had those spread offenses like Peyton Manning had and like Kirk, Kurt Warner had, it went through Edger and James and it went through Marshall Falk. Those were two Hall of Fame running backs that they had. There were two Hall of Fame running backs that those offenses went through. And you had to, you had to get a ground game going. Marshall Falk was an essential part in that Los, in that St. Louis Rams offense. Okay, I mean, and plus for the record, Cup took a took a hometown discount to stay in Los Angeles because he wanted to be with McVay. Um <clears throat> then he took a pay cut. Trading Smitty and rewarding Brown and with some one of the Browns attitude destroys locker rooms. Yeah. Because you're putting too much faith in your wideouts. My all, my football team can't be destinated or designated that the leaders on my team are the wideouts. I want to take that dimension out of there. Look what the Buffalo did. Some of you in here, <coughs> I mean, constantly, you don't get it. Stefan Diggs not being in Buffalo is the greatest thing ever to happen. Get that meathead out of there. I don't want to hear it's bitching anymore. Okay. I mean, I don't want to hear that guy bitching. Okay, Sills, everybody is at Mahomes or Brady to win with no name guys. Well, I'll tell you something. I saw a guy in Jordan Love go into Dallas and beat the piss out of the Dallas Cowboys. And I can't name you those receivers. They're all young guys. Okay. I'm talking about the greatest show on turf, Rams. And those guys were all good players, man. They were really good. Torrey Holt and all them guys, they were fabulous. But they weren't making big money like they are now. Matthew Stafford, I wouldn't consider Mahomes or Brady. Would you? Did he just not win one? I wouldn't consider Nick Foles, Mahomes or Brady. He won one. I mean, you don't have to be Tom Brady. And he beat Brady. You don't have to be Brady to win a Super Bowl. In the last 10 years, it's been proven. You could be Matthew Stafford or Nick Foles and win. Right? Who are you moving? You either have it or you don't. How many pieces does Jalen need? Could we imagine if we had Allen on the roster or even someone like Love? Correct. Someone who knows how to throw from the pocket. Hurts doesn't. It hurts you. That's why you went and got a running back. They're not signing guys like that in Buffalo or Kansas City. 
I think what they did with uh, Jordan Love, they're still not sure. You know why? They got Josh Jacobs. And you know what I also say this about Baltimore? I think they're not sure still. Eric DaCosta, Ozzie Newsom, Steve Biscotti. I'm not sure they think they can win a Super Bowl with just Lamar either. That's why Derrick Henry's in the room. I'm not sure they think that. I think it's Cincinnati. Burrow's got to stay healthy. And now there's no excuses for Herbert. By the way, look at what the Chargers did. Chargers got rid of every single top flight wide receiver. And he's going to have an MVP type season this year. Why? Well, he's got a great play calling head coach. Coaching matters. Ask Jordan Love. I mean, there's no big time wide out. They're going to draft a wide out. Could I see the Chargers trading for T. Higgins? Yeah. I could. I could see that. Eagles aren't moving anyone from the offense for 24. Now, next offseason, AJ will be traded, but not now. So you're gonna so you're gonna extend. Are you extending or are you picking the option up? If you the Eagles don't have the leverage here, they only have the leverage on one part of this story. The fifth year option. Don't you think they would have done that by now? Why haven't they done that? Are they thinking of trading A.J. Brown? Why wouldn't you have already done that? Now you have until May 2nd. But why wouldn't you want to get that out of the way? Seems like a foregone conclusion that you would pick up the fifth-year option, doesn't it? Saves you some money, gives you a little time. Um, Devontae gets to see what the market settles on with Jefferson and with Lamb. Why wouldn't you have done that? Or you think of trading him? Or you think of trading A.J. AJ Brown? It, Paul thinks that the Eagles have complete control. It shows you how stupid he is. If you offer me a a five-year contract extension, and I don't like it. I don't have to sign it. It's not mandatory I sign it. I'm still under contract with my rookie deal. And you have till May 2nd to pick up the option. And if you don't, I'm a free agent, and I walk out of your building last game of the year, Paul. That's how that works. That's a fact. Two $20 million wide receiver is possible. Half the DF are rookie deals. It's possible. What team has two $20 million wide receivers? Name me one. And a $50 million quarterback. Name me one. Name me one in the league. There isn't one. Jalen Waddle's still on a rookie contract. There isn't one. There's zero teams. With even 18 million and 25 million and 50. Somebody's going. Okay. Okay. Now here. Here's so, here, here, here. Why haven't they picked the option up? So so Philly D goes, so there isn't one doesn't mean. And it can't work. What it means is you're not addressing your defense because you're spending all your money on one side of the football, dude. And it's why you're going to win seven games because you're not addressing that side of the ball. You have an unbalanced roster and you know it. And yet you got a dilemma to deal with here. Sam hit on something. Absolutely. Why haven't, okay, what would be the reason you haven't picked up the May 2nd option for Devontae? Anyone? 
Dan, there's zero reason that D. Smith has to get extended this offseason. Okay. A.J. Brown is already you defend contract through 26. Okay. So you're going to pick the option up and have a guy. Why haven't you done it then? If it's a foregone conclusion, wouldn't that have been one of the first things you did? They've already picked the fifth-year option up on T. Higgins. They picked the fifth-year option up on um, Patrick Sertain, who was in that draft with Devontae Smith. Why haven't they picked that fifth-year? I think they picked the fifth-year option up on Jalen Waddell. Why haven't they done it in Philly? Any reason? Because they're trying to extend him first. So you're going to pay him more money than AJ. <laughs> Good luck. And you're going to have two $20 million wide receivers. Never work. No way will you start the season. If they give him a contract extension, you are not starting the season out with two $20 million wideouts. That's a foregone conclusion. I told you Stefan Diggs had no shot at being on the Bills this year when September came. Dead on. Not a chance that A.J. Brown would be on this team and they'll take the cap hit. Got the money to. I agree with Xander. Brown's a better player. Smitty's next up. Has nothing to do with being better. He's the next guy up. Seals, over the last 12 Super Bowls, only two winners had a top 10 receiver. Denver and L.A. Denver and L.A. We had two and lost in 22. Smitty's equity can be used to build the defense. True. Okay. Rumor has it they're trying to work a deal out for Smitty for $98 million. Okay. Over four? So you're going to pay him $25 million, which is more money than AJ. Five more million dollars than AJ makes per year. Is that what you're saying? Dave? Right? AJ got four years, a hundred million. Okay. So this is going to be four years, a hundred million. Why in the world would he take less money for a guy who signed a hundred million dollar contract two years ago? So he's going to take less of a market value deal. Why would he do that? It's not perfect. Who in their right mind would sign a two-year-old uh, value contract? You're in your your Devonte Smith, who's put up three grand in the last three years. How far did Chargers ever get with Williams and Allen? Okay, AJ's cap. I'm asking you, so you're going to sign Devontae Smith to the same contract that he signed two years ago, going on three years now. There's not a football team in the National Football League. You have the most expensive offensive huddle. If you extend that guy, you're going to have the highest payrolled offense in pro football. And the most underappreciated defense with cast offs and one year contracts. It's so unbelievably lopsided that you can't win. The Eagles have no chance to win with one year reclamation projects and hopes. There's not one for sure player 
on defense. Not one. It's a cast-off. It's, it's, it's a collection of cast-offs. Non-starters. People who were cut. Trades. Nothing with equity. You don't have one player on that side of the football field that you could trade with any equity except Jalen Carter. The rest of them, you could never get market value for what they were. Maybe Milton Williams. You could probably still get a three for him. The rest of them? You think you'd get the 13th pick in the draft for Jordan Davis? You couldn't get a first rounder for him. You'd be lucky to get a second rounder for him. Could you get a first rounder for Carter? Probably. Not the ninth pick. Um, Dean, could you get a third round? You couldn't get a seventh rounder for him. Devin White? If you put him on the open market, he was on the open market. You couldn't get a seventh rounder for him. I mean, Nolan Smith, could you get the 31st pick for him? You couldn't get a fifth rounder for him. What do you think you'd get for Bradbury? Seventh rounder? What would you get for Slay? Fourth, fifth rounder? Gardner Johnson. Fifth rounder? Reed Blankenship. I'm not interested in trading for him. Okay? No interest in that. And plus, with Bradbury's money that's tied to him, he has no market value. Now, you look at your offense. A.J. Brown, big value. Malata, big value. Landon, big value. Cam Jurgens, value. Lane, probably still great value. Goddard, some value. Saquon, value. Hurts, someone would give him money. You have no value on all, on defense, none. And you want to give a guy $20 million at wide receiver that will still result in you having a nuclear meltdown anyway because you haven't addressed the side of the football that caused your demise. The inability to move the ball and the inability to stop the run game. It may, it really makes no sense. It just doesn't make any sense. And, and here, <clears throat> why haven't they extended, or excuse me, why haven't they picked the option up? Because they want to sign him to a contract paying him more than A.J. Brown. Really? Really? And you're going to go. Now, I'll tell you one thing it also does. Hey, Xander, think of this. Everyone, think of this. If Jalen Hurts shits the bed and that football player um, absolutely craps out, it's a ready-made football team for a guy to walk in there and take right over. And he would have weapons after weapons waiting at his disposal. Could you trade Jalen Hurts for a first-round pick? If he has another shitty year? No. You couldn't. If he puts three shitty years to one good year as a starter on the resume, you'll never get a one for him. You can't have three shitty years and one good year. And call yourself an elite quarterback. Okay. 
And and here here's LJ. I'll disagree. LJ says zero percent chance AJ or Smitty gets traded. Filling time. Okay. Well, once again, it'd be the only thing in the league that's ever happened where two receivers were making twenty million dollars. It's not filling time. You know what filling time is? Is waiting to see what the Eagles are going to do, on what kind of deal they're going to put together. That's filling time, because they could end all of this by just giving him the option and picking it up. And it would end all contract negotiations. And you could pick this up next year. Why haven't they done that? Because they're looking at the collateral damage that they could have with that diva receiver on the other side. As once again, AJ doesn't know what he's talking about. He has no clue. Zero. When it comes to the fundamentals and how you look a couple years down the line, and also what you're looking at in the league and where the league's going now, the league would rather be on rookie contracts than paying veteran wideouts. You see that, right? It's becoming more prevalent that they would rather get on a they would rather get on a rookie contract with a receiver. Get the equity of the rookie receiver with the big money quarterback and get as many years out of that receiver as they can before they move him. Once again, Devontae Adams, two teams. AJ Brown, two teams. Stefan Diggs, three teams. Tyreek Kill. Two teams. All these big-time wideouts that you guys keep telling me are so important to teams, why in the last five years have they all been moved to multiple teams if they're so important to the success of a team? Why? You don't trade benchmark players at 25 years of age if they're crucial to your success. Why are these organizations moving off these guys? Mike Williams is now on his second team. Why is that? I mean, these guys are moved more than edge rushers. Okay. Now, I'd say saying each team values positions differently. Really? Since when do the Eagles value wide receiver positions? The last two years? Oh, wow. So that's a change in philosophy. They value their receivers more on the perimeter. Okay. First time ever. Now, get this. Kansas City doesn't value them. Um, Buffalo doesn't value them. Who else? Um, Cincinnati's still in a good position because Jamar Chase is on a rookie contract. Um, the Rams don't value wide receiver positions. You got one guy making great money. The rest of them, shit, Puka Nakua was drafted in the third round. They'd rather be on a rookie contract. Get this. You know how you balance that out? Cups money, third round money. Okay. You can't balance dick out. You know why? You failed numerous times in your draft. You have, You do not work the equity of a rookie contract in Philly. Again, that hurts you defensively. You're in the position you're in right now defensively because you don't handle your equity and your business right in drafting. Okay? Which contenders don't have stud wide receivers? Which contenders have won Super Bowls with stud receivers? I'll wait. Mike Evans wasn't on his contract that he is now. He'll never win again in, in uh, Tampa. Name me one. Tyreek Hill's not winning one. C.D. Lamb's not going to win one. A.J. Brown hasn't won one. Devontae Adams hasn't won one. All these stud receivers, what have they won? The overpaying of quarterbacks and wide receivers is prevalent now. Kyler Murray's not going to win. Derek Carr's not going to win. Josh Allen hasn't won yet. Joe Burrow hasn't won. Justin Herbert hasn't won. Jalen Hurts hasn't won. Lamar Jackson hasn't won. And you, you'll go, well, okay, well, why not be like the 49ers? Pay everyone else and not the quarterback. I can win with Matthew Stafford. Antonio Brown was making $1 million on a one-year prove-it deal in Tampa. He wasn't making big money. What are you talking about? 
He got fired with the Raiders, got fired in New England. Then he got fired in, after the year with – that's how Tampa signed him. Signed him to a $1 million deal. Okay? <clears throat> Once again, LJ's right on the cap hit. Still, you got to pay the guy. Why in the world would I want to pay a guy $50 million if he's not worth it? He's right. Get this. The only thing that's good on the Jalen Hurts contract right now is the cap hit. He's sure not playing to a $50 million guy. He's not a $50 million quarterback. He can't read defenses. He was third in sacks when it came to blitzes, and he was awful on third down. I don't know. $50 million? And a completely nuclear implosion. That's a $50 million guy. Derek Carr's certainly not a big money guy. I'm not paying that money. Um, Hey, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin and AB, we're not making big money. Okay? And he can't evaluate players around him like the other $50 million quarterbacks do. Um, Elevate. Excuse me. He can't... Hey... I think, like I said, how about this one too? Anthony, it's not that he can't elevate those guys. They got their numbers. He can't elevate himself. In two years, hey, Anthony, have you ever seen this? A quarterback two years in a row has two wide receivers go over 1,000 yards, and that quarterback can't get over 25 touchdown passes in any given season and go over 3,900 yards passing. Have you ever seen that? It tells you the struggles he has. And then you'll turn around and go, well, he has won 25 games. True. If the Eagles were in the AFC, they're not winning those. They're playing against better people. Like last year, those coordinators would have been torn apart by those quarterbacks. You were torn apart by Drew Locke. I mean, I used to be a Hurts fan as well, but my eyes are widening this past season. That's crazy. Let's do this. Let's give him the 24 year. I think you give him the 24 year because there's no excuses now. You got the you got a so-called coordinator. Um, you you you've added, and now you're going to add 20 million to Devontae's pocket. How many people think Devontae Smith is a 20 million dollar wide receiver? Like when I build my offense around him, is that DK Metcalf or Debo Samuel? Would you pay him 20? Would you pay Jalen Waddle 20? I mean, is that guy Jamar Chase? He's surely not just, I mean, I'm not going to compare him to Justin Jefferson. Tua says he's worth it. Is he? Okay, well, let's do this. Hey, Cowboy fan, 304. How many yards did uh, CeeDee Lamb have last year? Over 1,700 yards? Is C.D. Lamb a $20 million guy, $25 million guy, $23, $24 million? Is, is, he, is he a top flight $24 million guy? Would you pay that for him? Ty, you think C.D. Lamb is a uh, $25 million a year guy? Three hundred four goes like this. I'm a huge CD Lamb face, CD Lamb fan, so I'll say yes. Okay. So when a three hundred four, let me ask you this. So when you see CD Lamb, you see Devonte Adams, DK Metcalf, you see AJ Brown, and you see those guys when you see him playing, right? 
don't know. I see Devontae Smith when I see him. Remember, Smith is getting his numbers out of a second roll. Okay. CD Lamb is a track star wide receiver. If it's a physical game, he's a non entity. Look what Alexander did to him. Shut him completely down. I thought the Packers mugged him. He's reliable and no drama guy. He's worth the money. He is a no drama guy in a drama city and on a drama team and on a drama franchise. Okay? Hey, don't forget, Dave Wanstat's going to join us. And we'll get his thoughts at 4.30. Guy works for the Chicago Bears broadcast team, also Fox Sports, three-time Super Bowl defensive coordinator with the Cowboys. We will talk with him. And also Chuck Todd. We'll talk a little sports with him. He's a gigantic sports fan, the news director at NBC News, and a dear friend of mine for years. will join us. That'll be at 5.30 Eastern time. Talk a little OJ with him. We will also talk, by the way, that 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 whole OJ thing was interesting listening to Bob Costas. Bob Costas was great friends with him. And um I didn't know that Bob Costas got a call from OJ from the Bronco. And he was trying to get a hold of Bob Costas when he was in the Bronco. And some technician answered it and just put the phone down. Jalen's cap it is $14 million. Josh, Josh Allen's is $30 million. That's why we can spread the money at other premium positions. Cap number is all about all that matters. Again, I'm not paying for somebody who's not worth it. And I don't get, and, and get this. LJ wants you to have the highest pay. You have the highest payroll. You sign that extension. You will have the highest payroll for a quarterback who can't get it done. The, obje- the objective is to have a quarterback that makes players around him better. Not players around him make the quarterback better. That's your problem in Philly. You're trying to put so many good players around Jalen Hurts to make him better. Hurts has to make them better. Those players are not elevating his game. That's a fa- His game has not elevated with the addition of two 1,000-yard receivers and a 1,000-yard back. His game has not elevated. And if you can't see that, words can't get through to you then. His actions get through to you. Nuclear meltdown, second in INT, no comparison to where he was two years ago. Those players around him are not elevating his game. Facts. No matter how much money you spend, you're not elevating his game. No matter who you hire, you're not elevating his game. Hertz has not elevated his game. Where? 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 Hey, Greg, don't be upset because I'm pointing out the facts and you want to spend... $20 $20 million on a wide receiver who in the last two years has given you over 2,200 yards in receptions. The other guy's given you almost three grand and the quarterback hasn't gotten better. First in INTs was Josh Allen and four straight AFC championships and has a better winning percentage than Jalen Hurts. He's a better player. with. And by the way, They're not adding players to his huddle. They're making him elevate the players around him, unlike your guy. You've got to spend a treasure trove of players and money so that it takes apart your defense. Guess what? To try to make Jalen Hurts the quarterback that they want him to be, they're sacrificing the equity and the players on defense to do it. That's the frustration covering the Eagles. They don't get it. They would rather have Hurts get better than win games. 
they should be putting more of their emphasis on the defensive side of the ball this year instead of signing running backs and working on contract extensions for guards and tackles and for um, whomever. Josh Allen, silver medal. Uh, no, doesn't matter. But I'm not spending a ton of money for him. I'm spending a ton of money for your guy. Now you want another? Get this. Here's what LJ wants. Spend. So here's what you'll do if you sign a contract extension. You will now spend an additional $15 million on the brand new contract for Landon Dickerson. Another 10 for Barkley. And another 20 per year for her. You'll spend $50 million on offense and increasing the uh, salaries on players, not counting the quarterback. 50 million bucks. And in places like Kansas City and in Buffalo and in Los Angeles with the Chargers, they're expecting their quarterback to make others around them better. Not others around them to make their quarterback better. That's the difference. And by the way, I'll eat that $30 million cap hit with Josh Allen when I don't have any first flight. Get this. So how, how about this? Jalen Hurts plays for a franchise that wants to win. No, they don't. Uh, they want control. Uh, get, get this. So LJ's telling you that $30 million cap hit for Josh Allen is, is, is not worth it. And yet, he's the only guy they have. If Josh Allen's not on the Bills, they're a three-win team. If Jalen Hurts is not on that team, they're a nine-win team. You should be with all that talent. If Jay, Hey, get this. If Jalen Hurts is not on that team and you're paying all that money and you guys win five games, well, you overpaid for everyone. That's a bum. You got the highest salary offense in pro football. Allen will miss the playoffs. Jalen won't go to a Super Bowl with a hundred and fifty-five million dollar offensive payroll. <laughs> the most expensive car in the in the entire race won't get it done again. The players in that huddle don't make that quarterback. Hey, has AJ Brown and Devontae Smith elevated Jalen Hurts? Yes or no? Have, 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 have they? They have. Then why, why is he high in turnovers? Then hey, DMC, they elevated him. He can't throw for 25 touchdowns. And he, and he was third or second in turnovers. How did he elevate his game? How did those two wide receivers elevate his game? And you went one and seven down the stretch. How did they elevate his game? And you had a 1,200-yard back. How did they elevate his game? Coaching. Wait a minute. Coaching couldn't have been that bad. Your two wide receivers are two 1,000-yard receiving guys in that's like almost unprecedented. Two years in a row? Coach, you couldn't have been that bad. Those guys got their numbers. What guy's working on a contract extension now? So wait a minute. If things were so bad for the offense last year, Landon Dickerson got a contract extension. Um, Devontae Smith is working on one, and you just signed a $100 million wide or a, a, a $10 million back. How could it have been that awful? He was second in turnovers to your boy. Okay. Still wins as much as your guy. And wins division titles. Unlike your guy.
Okay? Amari Cooper playing way better in Cleveland than he did in Dallas. Kevin Stefanski's a good coach. Sales Chase, Waddle, and Smitty are all due to get extended or their fifth-year options exercises. None have. Chase is a true number one. He is. Waddle and Smitty are number twos. Yes. But I do like Smitty, man. I'm not. Hey, you know I do. You know I do. Wins as much at less than half the cap hit and wins as much with less the payroll you pay for your team. So the cap hit's worth it. Every, get this, every price you pay. This is where LJ and I completely differ because every bit of money you pay for Josh Allen is worth it because you know why? You're not spending money on a wideout. You're not spending money on a running back. You're barely spending money on the O-line. You have no money invested in tight end and it's all in the quarterback. So if his cap hits high, fine. I'm spending a ton of money at my receivers, my offensive line, my running back, my backups. It's the highest payroll in the NFL is Philly. So if I've got a high cap hit for the only star in my huddle, okay, sure. You see, Allen is being asked to elevate players around him. Players around Hertz are being asked to elevate Jalen, which means this. The more they add money and players around Hertz, the less I am confident he'll ever win again. And so is Philly. Get this. You had more confidence in Carson Wentz. You didn't spend money around Carson Wentz. Not like this. You spent no money. You had no money invested in wideouts. You had a tight end and a back O-line. No, you didn't even have a back. You had, you had two guys you, you picked off the open market when you went in the Super Bowl in 17. Okay? You spent no money on your offense. Your O-line... Shit, your old line is not as near as good as it is now. And you didn't spend near the money. <laughs> Shit, Jason Peters even went down. You had backups in the old line. We won off talent or scheme. Got exposed, Sills. Um... I think the talent doing the same shit, Nick. That's probably more it, what happened last year. And then, then the talent quit on the scheme. And, and then they quit on the coach. And let it elevated his eye. That's all that guy has. He doesn't tell you he's won four straight AFC championships or four straight AFC East championships and has a higher win percentage than Jalen Hurts. He doesn't tell you that. The Bills were in salary cap hell, so they had to let go most of their players. Yeah. 44 million. Well, they were $43 million over the cap. Most of them were defensive players. So let's be accurate, right, Prince? Most of them were the defensive players that they let go. Pair and all them guys. Most of them were the... Uh, Defensive guys. They let a ton of defensive guys go. That's correct, Bob. Bob, this is clearly one of the takes that I've had for the last 10 years. Seals championship teams make tough choices. Belichick would trade a player a year or two early instead of a year too late. Reed traded Tyree Kill. This move will show us who Hurts is. Um, yeah, we all know we had Kansas city beat in the super bowl. There was a fluke pick six fumble and they won by a field goal. Jalen outplayed my Dave. That is such a lame ass take. We don't know that. Why? Because they've done it two years in a row. 
This guy has a fantasy, Dave, about something that he said that was – get this. He had better numbers. But when it mattered the most, Mahomes outplayed him. In games like that, it's not about a stat line. It's about making critical plays and critical coaching decisions that win you those games. Not putting up numbers and not putting up scores. It's scoring at the right time and making the big play at the right time. That's the difference, son. So Ellen had a stacked team too. No, he, he didn't have anybody. St- no, he's never had a stacked team ever. There's, that old line is good, not great. Allen has had a top 10 offense because of Allen, dickhead. Because of Allen. You mean to try to tell me you actually think that there's two 1,000-yard receivers on that team and a 1,200-yard back and three or four pro bowlers in the O-line? Are you high? And he's got a defensive coach. This guy is lying. He's trying to make a lie fit hurts like a jacket. He's lying. He's completely lying. completely lying um let me see here look okay one thing is for sure he went to the damn super bowl when they played defense hey slagger again that super bowl appearance is fool's gold on how good he is i pointed out to you that there are numerous quarterbacks that have got you think he, what Rex Grossman's great, or like Mark Sanchez going to three straight AFC titles is great. Crazy, crazy. I mean, hey, so you're going to spend as much money as you possibly can. You have to keep salary in context with personnel on the club. A.J., Saquon, Goddard, lots of options, less individual productivity at some point. You must get there. So the Bills' defense wasn't stacked. Um, Again, your offense is stacked. I'm talking about a balanced football team. Buffalo didn't have to have a stacked offense. If they had better play, they were pretty good defensively up there. Absolutely. That's why they had to jettison most of the players this offseason that were on the defensive side. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't have anything on defense stacked. You win with defense and you win with a quarterback. That's what Buffalo's looking at. You think you win with an offense and no defense. And the year you had a defense, You did go to the Super Bowl. Well, when all those players left and you had to do it all over again, you couldn't. Rex Grossman was never in the MVP talk. Carson Wentz was. Finished second, too. Carson Wentz was. Holy cow. Bang. Current D. Draft two cover linebackers in the second. Would work to keep wide receivers. If Vic runs a title, mint and nickel, given UGA and Florida State from 15 to 17. Um, I think you're talking about Hang it, leave that up, Xander. 15 and 17. Florida State, you're probably talking about verse. Ran, ran those fronts. Nolan excels. Jack linebacker and sweat could put 
could could but must move weak. White and Jack interesting but can't at inside linebacker. I would say this, James. He's going to run that 34, though. But you're saying if he goes to nickel, 15 and 17 with sweat, put verse on the other side out there. Is that what you're saying? Um, I got what he, I got where he's coming from. Let me take a look at that. I want to double check that. I want to double check it. That's all. Look, I, I I'm, I'm just going to ask a question here. Okay. And even 34. Okay. And even um, you're going to be in that front. You're going to go to nickel. Most of the time, you're going to be in at 69.8% of the time. Um, so you like the kid verse there. I think he's good. I, I, I mean, you'd have to move up to get him. Because where you are right now, the only edge guy that's going to be down there is going to be that Latou kid from UCLA. So you're going to have to think about po possibly him. Defense at 22 was overrated. Once the D-line didn't get pressure, the secondary got destroyed by Mahomes. Nick, a lot of that. They played bum quarterbacks that year. Go back and look at who they played. They played a ton of bums. They weren't very good. They were giving up like 75% completion percentage to all the really good ones that they played. And they were completely, it was totally fool's gold in a lot of ways. They were like 17th against the run. They had a high volume sacks. They used Reddick right. And once they got to two defensive tackles, Linville Joseph, and they got Adamic and Sue in there, they were able to use him in a way that helped his skill set a lot more. Okay. Get, get this. DMC, hey, DMAC, here's something else. You don't have four linebackers. Get this. So you're addressing a contract extension with age with, with Devontae Smith, and you don't have four linebackers worth of shit. Where is your priority? They're they they have no priority on defense. None. That that the Hassan Reddick deal is all you need to know. Oh, where's the extension still? I forgot to open the show with that. I mean it. They have no priority. And they're assuming that this coach is going to fix this. No way. No way. No way does that guy fix that. No way. Not a chance he fixes that. Um, Bob Brown. Sills holding both wide receivers keeps the Eagles on the Roseman roller coaster. If both stay, we could have a good or even great year. Then we tear it down because bills must be paid. No sustained success. That's what Jeff Kerr, who goes on with birds 365 all the time says, there's just no consistency there. Not giving a 30 year old 25 million. See that right there? Frederick goes, I'm not giving a, but you'll, hey, Frederick goes like this. I'm not giving a 30 year old 25 million. Who said the Jets are? Why didn't you just keep them? The Jets aren't giving them 25 either. Frederick, why didn't you just keep them? You'd rather pay for a guy who's not a starter. You paid $18 million for a guy who's not a starter. And even how he said he's a projection. So you went from a player who gave you four years in a row and two years in Philly, 27 sacks, to a guy you're projecting to be a three-down player who's never been. In the time he's been in the league and he wasn't drafted. Okay, well, good luck again. We shall see. They want him to be Redick. 
We had Reddick. You you had Reddick. Okay. Marshall, man, you've been great. Thank you, man. Okay. Um, I don't know what's, let's see here. Let's see if they pay the money. Well, they have it. The 15 to 17 was for 2015 and 17 at FSU when Sarah was there and they ran the title and mint prior to smart doing at George, you at Georgia. So all our front have experience in the 34. It's a great take. That's why, James, now I got it. So that they're going back to the third. Okay, now I got it. James, you think the personnel that they got from Georgia and one of the reasons that they're bringing the 34 back is because N'Kobe Dean, Nolan Smith, Kelly Ringo, Jordan Davis, and uh, Jalen Carter all played in that front when even Tracy Rocker was the D-line coach down in Georgia. Got it. Okay. Got it. So they're going back to familiarity. And he met Josh Sweat, too, at Florida at Florida State, too. I got it. So we, they're all going to be familiar. They're all going to be familiar, okay, with what they're looking at when they go to these OTAs. I think they start Monday, that brand-new OTA that they have in there, right? This is a hammer year. Five wins. Nick will be fired. Hurts could be two, depending on – how bad it really is. This team would probably be in a dogfight with the Panthers. Wow. That I'm hope, not hoping for. Okay. That's why the Eagles got so many OTAs. Taylor. Marshall hit it. Okay. Okay. see here James yeah next week is cardio I heard though they're going to need to be in cardio they're going to need to be in really hey that's good too so they're actually going to like get in shape this year that's a big thing but if they draft two inside cover LBs then we could be set with their existing players yeah they don't have the starting linebackers on their football team right now they they just don't. Okay, they just don't have that. All right, Dave wants that's going to join us. Um, at the bottom of the hour, we are going to talk with him, and we're going to get his thoughts, and we'll see what he has to say. And by the way, we'll ask him about all this because Dave wants that won three Super Bowls as a defensive coordinator in National Football League with the Dallas Cowboys. And he was the coordinator on those Cowboy teams. He did not run a 34. He ran a 43. But we'll ask him what you said, James, especially with the linebacker position. We'll talk that. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on in Chicago because Chicago's the only team that really has control of this draft right now. Why? They have the first pick. Okay? Hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN.
Philadelphia fans were cut from a different cloth. Born into a brotherhood and bonded to our team for life. We believe anything is possible because we've witnessed the impossible. While we may be from different neighborhoods, come Sunday, we are one and we will be heard. Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech, we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Mike Little was a union construction worker who was badly, badly injured when he suffered a horrific fall because of someone's negligence. His life would change forever. It was just a real downward spiral with everything. Everything you do, and you're sitting home by yourself all day. Have no, you know, you can't go out because you can't drive, you can't walk well. It was just a horrible situation. Call Brian Fritz at the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm at 215-548-2222. E-A-G-L-E-S Eagles Big Sales You want to hear something? The Dallas Cap Who do you think has had more success in the draft Over the last 10 years? The Cowboys or the Eagles? Who's had more success? Cowboys or Eagles? In the draft. Senor. Says obviously Eagles. Not what I said about better players. Who's had more success in the last 10 years in the draft? The Eagles or the Cowboys? Well, here. <clears throat> in the last 10 years, the Dallas Cowboys have drafted 15 Pro Bowlers. The runner-up is the Ravens with 12. They do a better job than you in the draft. Where Jerry falls short, coaching, hires, and meddling. Where the Eagles fall short is... Not letting a good thing lie. You had to coach. You couldn't stand it. You fired him. Firing Doug Peterson over a four-win season is not good enough when he delivered a Super Bowl to you. And you did everything possible to sabotage that team as an organization. And you're doing it again. Your repetitive influence on how you think things should be run hampers your ability to stay successful every single year. It's a fact the Cowboys have 15 pro bowlers they've drafted. And, and the, the Cowboys drafted five all pros since 2020. Alone, last four years. Again, the problem comes down to coaching. Expectations. Ravens are second with 12. How he's doing it again to get little Nick fired. Senor, I completely agree. Well, yeah. The more you put around Nick, here it. Hey, hey, senor, check this out. Isn't it odd? They're putting so much around Nick. 
and they're putting so much around Hurts. I'm wondering how much faith they have in both. I mean, I don't think there's any coincidence to that. Both guys, they're doing everything they can to like save their careers, I think. Andrew goes would have another Super Bowl already if had Doug Peterson, Sirianni, and Gannon terrible in the Super Bowl. Andrew, correct. 22, Doug's the coach, they win it. And you have two. But they couldn't leave well enough alone. That's the difference between Pittsburgh. Now, I will say this about Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh in the last decade with Mike Tomlin, the standard has lowered there. That's why um, this thing here with uh, Russell Wilson, is 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 this is to get him back into the playoffs again because the last 10 years haven't been kind okay to um to Mike Tomlin in the postseason compared the last drafts between Cowboys and Eagles from 16 and now basically when Dak and Carson were drafted um Forrest Hill who have they drafted on defense that's been worth the shit outside of Jalen Carter? Nobody. In the last five years, who they've drafted? Nothing. Milton Williams? Okay. I mean, almost the last 10 years, they've drafted nobody. Josh? Okay. Yeah, all right. Josh Sweat and Jalen Carter in the last 10 years. The rest of them are bums. And no equity in the rookie deals and paying for mistakes. Don't you see that? How he pays for mistakes and covers it by giving them the owner's bag of money, like LJ says, up front. Okay? And not having the cap hit, and he justifies it by going, well, they don't really count against our cap. But you lose the equity of the rookie contracts to build the balanced roster to be consistent on a year-to-year -year basis. This is the frustration of them. They Get this. They do a ton of things great. They do. I don't want to just – hey, they do a ton of things great. Before we get to Dave Wanstead at the bottom of the hour here, I do want to do this. And I have to say this here. Before I get Coach Wants that on. Dio, thank you, my friend. Russell Wilson has to be the most out-of-touch human being I have ever seen in my life. He is one of the most disgraceful. He is one of the most... just not in touch with the history of the league. He's not even in touch with his black heritage at quarterback. And here's where I'm going here. So he was asked a question. Um, hey, these quarterbacks today, like Patrick Mahomes, stand on the shoulders of what I've done by me opening doors to black quarterbacks in today's game on me going back to back Super Bowls. It was me who opened these doors. And I was like, do you know who Fritz Pollard is? Do you know who Marlon Briscoe is? Do you know who Joe Gilliam is? Do you know who Steve McNair is? 
Do you know Warren Moon? Those are the shoulders where racism, when they looked at him and saw a black face, that's when racism was at a all-time high. Doug Williams has been on this program twice, and he's one of my dear friends. Me and this man right here, Leroy Selman, used to go to Selman's Steakhouse right here. We'd sit down and we would talk, me, Jimmy Giles, and him. We'd sit here at Leroy Selman's. Have a great time. And I said, Doug, why'd you leave Tampa? Well, the owner, Hugh Culverhouse, didn't want to pay me more money because he told me he didn't want the face of the franchise to be a black face. I'm like, come again? I played for Hugh Culverhouse. I was like, come again? He's like, yeah, he gave me a $50,000 deduction. I had taken the Bucks to playoffs four or five years. And if you, some of you guys are old enough to remember, he even beat the Eagles in a playoff game. And I was like this. So they gave you less money? He went to the USFL. And then when he won the Super Bowl in San Diego, I asked him. When those seconds were ticking off the clock and you were named the most valuable player, and you were walking off the field after beating, I think Miami in the Super in the Super Bowl. I said, "What were you thinking?" He goes, "I said, thank you, God. I was right." His wife had just died too. Culverhouse didn't want to make him the face of the franchise because he was black. They didn't want to pay him. That's racism. I cried when Doug Williams won the Super Bowl because. I know what pain he went through. That guy, talk about shoulders that you stand on. That's shoulders you stand on, not Russell fucking Wilson. The most obnoxious human being of all time who ever played that position to say that Patrick Mahomes stands on his shoulders. Man, how do you go there? Man, Marlon Briscoe, James Harris, Joe Gilliam. You know, Joe Gilliam was better than Terry Bradshaw, but you know why Joe Gilliam wasn't the quarterback of that football team? He had a drug addiction. It wasn't talent. It was a drug addiction he had. Chuck Noll loved him. But they had to get him off the team because of his drug problem. What a disgrace. Black community has fought its ass off. To see the players today where they are, where money is not an issue and face of the franchise is not an issue. To have that guy say that, you forget all the people in the past that paved the way. That's not knowing your surroundings or your history and thinking it starts with you. And that's why the selfishness that Carol had to deal with in Seattle, he was right in the end. This guy's a loser. I wish nothing but failure for him. You can't win football games and galvanize a football team when you think the center of the universe revolves around you. It's got to revolve around your team. Whew. Patrick Mahomes stands on his shoulders. My God almighty, bro, you're not that good. You're a really good ball player. But do you really think you had to go through the racial taunts that Doug Williams did when they were using the N-word at Tampa Stadium and they were burning crosses in his front lawn when they drafted him? What is he talking about? I mean, man, crazy. But I'll just say this to you. When I used to sit around with Doug Williams and Leroy Selman at um, Selman's in Tampa, Jimmy Giles too, we'd talk about 
you know, Doug's incredible time there for five years. He took the team to the playoffs and had his chance. Now he works up in Washington, if I'm not mistaken, in the front office still, even after the change in ownership. Doug Williams and Leroy Salmon are like, Leroy is one of my best friends. And my coach played, uh, my coach coached him, Jimmy Johnson, when he was at Oklahoma. And Barry Switzer, who was on a couple, I think Barry was on last week, says he's the best football player he's ever coached. And that's saying a lot, them OU teams back in the day. Speaking of a guy who coached a guy like Aaron Donald and some of the greatest players of all time, won a Super Bowl, <clears throat> head coach. He's up with the Bears now in their broadcast team, and there's a lot going on in Chicago. And he's a guy that, yes, even tolerated me. My coach, my friend, Dave wants that. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate you doing this. Uh, anytime, Danny. Just um, down here in Naples, Florida, kind of hanging on a little bit. Um, uh, hopefully, I'll see Jimmy next week. Uh, we're talking about getting together uh, middle of next week over there in the Keys somewhere, having a cold one. And uh, so we'll see. But it's it's good. Everything's good now. Yeah. yeah as you said, getting ready for the draft. It, it's here. I'll be heading to. Chicago well, in about a week, and um, a lot going on up there, as you mentioned, in the pregame. How about this, Coach? It's got to be rewarding to see Jimmy back with the fold of the Cowboys and all the things that you guys – you know, what? I was asked a question a couple uh, days ago. What was that like being there with these guys? I said, you know what the first thing they had to do? They had to win the locker room over. And they had to win their for formula over. These guys are showing college highlights on fundamentals on what they wanted us to look like as pros. And for the older guys, that's when I looked over at Crawford Kerr and I told people, I went, 90% of this roster won't be here next year, including my ass, because this is, they're going to get guys in here that are going to buy in and they are going to get guys in there that are going to believe. Coach, it's kind of where you are a little bit especially if you're one of these organizations that are trying to build a roster, you got to figure out who's going to go along and play along. Yeah. I, I think in today's game, you know, what, what we did at Dallas, uh, particularly coming from college, you know, with no NFL experience, really. I mean, you know, for the most part. So we're, uh, we're coming in there and we're putting in our playbook, our system, and the only way that that would be successful, and I think that's why there's been so many college coaches fail, is because they go in and they try to uh, put in their system with their mentality and their culture into a veteran locker room. And that's not going to fly. Where at Dallas, Jimmy had carte blanche on all the personnel, uh, and the guys knew where the buck stopped. There was no GM or there was no owner back then that or anybody else that was going to be involved with whether they made the team or they didn't. So, you know, I mean, I remember our first mini camp. I had a confrontation with a player on the sidelines during a drill. And it was during, I think it was the first mini camp, second practice. He comes over and he started. And I said, we can't, that's not how we do it. I'm, I'm, you got, you know, we're going to have, you know, I'm almost like, what do you guys know? So we went in my office afterwards and about took two minutes and Jimmy come walking in the office. He says, what do you think? I went, what do you think? He says, I'll handle it. He was gone. That was it. So, yeah. uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a very unique situation to get in. I mean, when you look around the NFL today, all these college coaches or all these coaches that are getting hired as head coaches, number one, a lot of them have never been a coordinator. I mean, they've never stood up in front of the room on any level. And now they're going to go in and try to install a new culture. And they're going to try to turn this thing around with players that have been in the league and they're as old as they are in some cases, uh, that's a tough, tough assignment with the owners being involved a lot more than they ever been with the general managers being involved a lot more than they've ever been. That's a real tough blueprint to follow in my opinion. Coach, do you think today, if you were in the game as a D coordinator, you ran the 43, 
Is today's passing offense more conducive to the 34 because of the cover people would you have to do with linebackers, running backs coming out of the backfield because it's more of a passing game? Back when we were there, it was more of a third down defense where you were looking at the big back. If you were in the game, would you be more open to running that 34 or would you stick to that 43 still? You know what, Dan? When I was coaching at the University of Pittsburgh, Mike Tomlin became the head coach. And um, he kept Dick LeBeau as his defensive coordinator. And Dick and I got along real good. And I, and I knew Mike. I was the head coach of the Dolphins when Mike was the secondary coach at Tampa Bay with Tony Dungy. We worked against those guys in the summer. So I was dying to get into this 3-4 defense just to learn it, really. I mean, we weren't going to change anything at Pitt, but, but I, was just, I just wanted to learn because we're sharing the same facilities, you know, yeah. fields, you know, all that stuff at Pittsburgh. So I sat down with Mike Tomlin one time because Mike was a 4-3 guy. The Tampa Bay Bucks, as you know, ran the same defense virtually that we ran in Dallas, same philosophy. They were more of a cover one, a one deep. We were more of a two deep. Then they went to the Tampa two. We went to quarters coverage. But the front was almost the same. Okay. With that being said, I I remember saying that to Mike Tomlin, well, you're a 4-3 guy, and Dick LeBeau's running the 3-4. He says, says, Dave, it's not. Look what happens. James Harrison is an outside linebacker for us. And anytime we even think that it might be a pass – James Harrison's rushing the passer. He said, it's it's really, so to answer your question, the 4-3 defense, I think it's more relevant today huh. than what it's ever been because the only thing it's really changed, you know, they're rushing four guys. Most teams are rushing four guys 80% of the time anyway, okay? So whether it's an outside linebacker or a defensive end, and I'll put up that argument all day long. Give me a guy that's standing up, and you're going to move him from side to side and try to trick people. And he's watching the ball. Is he coming? Is he not? As compared to a Charles Haley that's going to put his hand on the ground or Jason Taylor or Richard Dent, guys that I've coached, and they're going to put their hand on the ground. And that's all they do all day. And what you did, Danny, and they're moving on the ball and they're focusing on the offensive line and they're working on their, their craft where they're lined up. I'll take that guy anytime as compared to trying to get, you know, I think sometimes you can get too cute. That's just my belief, my philosophy. So to answer your question, no, I, uh, and and you see it sometimes. I mean, you, I mean, we did it. We did it at Dallas. I mean, there were times that I was dropping Leon Lett and Russell, our Tony Casillas, our nose guard, you know, and, and, or we would drop the defensive end and we would bring the nickel back. So we did some of that stuff, you know, just as a little mix but hey, when when you gotta get it, you want guys that 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 are confident, know what they're gonna do, and hopefully we got better players than they do, and and we get after them, which we did with you and Jerome and Stubby, and you know it's the reason we were one of the, if not the best defense in college football down there in Miami. Coach, let me go here with you. Um, I think the familiarity that you guys had in college and in the pros was a direct result of the success that you guys had. And now Vic Fangio um, is a defensive coordinator in, in Philadelphia. And it seems coach that he has autonomy on the type of personnel. They move Reddick. I think that was him. Reddick didn't like to be dropped in coverage. Well, they get Bryce Huff. Who's more open to being dropped in coverage. That's going to be a Vic guy. How important for you was it to have familiarity with your position coaches? Because, Coach, if I remember right, there was a guy before you in 85. I think he went to Texas Tech or something. And then you came in from Southern Cal, but you had had a relationship with almost every single coach on our coaching staff because of the past with you and Jimmy and Butch and with Coach Campo and all them guys. You knew all of them. So we were all like, oh, they know one another. But how important is that for you to pick your coaches, your assistant coaches on defense as a coordinator, or to have familiarity with how they're going to coach your guys? Well, I I think it it saves so much time. You know, it saves so much time in uh, knowing how guys are going to present stuff. 
uh, knowing what guys really believe in and what's strong, you know, I mean, Butch and I were together for so many years, in yeah. so many different places that, that, uh, I never had a doubt. I knew exactly what, how Butch was going to coach you guys and what, what he liked during the game. And uh, we communicated well on game day. Uh, you know, same thing with Campo going back, you know, so the communication, I tell you, it can save a lot of time with really the biggest thing is, is making adjustments. And when you're putting a game plan together, you're not wasting time of having to go through something. Oh, let's guys, let's try this. This could be really good, you know, and, and where we would say, you know what, we, we've been there. We've done that. Let's not even waste time with that. Next, let's move on. So I think we, we could be a lot more efficient because we were together for so long. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad that Vic is doing that. It's uh, uh, He's also I, added some extra OTAs also, Coach, yeah. so that because they're going to a different-looking scheme on the 34, they were more in five front last year. So yeah. they want these guys to get a little bit more familiar. Now, is that more for the players or for the assistants to be able to, like you said, eliminate – dead time i think both i think okay. both you know and and i'll tell you i'm a big fan of vix if he's ever on the show or you're talking to him you let him know that i mean he's he's not you know the, the his philosophy and I'm, i've studied him going back to when he, and he was at harbaugh san francisco and before that at india all along and when he was with the bears you know i was up at training camp with him doing camp and he you know he's not going to give up a lot of big plays He's not over the top on blitzing. You know, the philosophy is I, I could relate to what he was doing. And, uh, you know, he, he when, when they had their best teams in San Francisco, they were rushing four and they were getting same thing at the Bears. When the Bears is had, he aggressive, coach? He's not going to talk much. He's, he's, but he is hard nosed and he's old school. And I think that's what happened in Miami. You know, he, he, uh, uh, you know, it was a great hire. I mean, Nick Sirianni, he needed uh, to do something. And uh, because I think, you know, I think he got exposed a little bit last year when he lost his two coordinators and uh, bringing in a guy like Vic with his experience. Uh, it, that's, that was a good hire for Nick. It really was. I think it'll help him. You know, coach that I, I always say this cause I, you know, I think it's one of the greatest coaching staffs in the history of college and pro football. Cause you guys had success at both levels. And they always ask me, what was it? I go, you always knew we stood with these guys. You know, we had so much talent. They didn't have to lie to you. They just went like this. No, you're next. Or, hey, I, I, I tell the story on Selwyn Brown. Selwyn Brown sitting next to me. And he got beat at a couple passes. He comes over and Jimmy comes over to him. and goes like this to him. Hey, um, anything we can do? And I'm sitting there. I'm tying my shoes. He looks over. He goes, what the hell was that? I go, I don't know. And Jerome looks over at me, too. I'm sitting here. Jimmy comes over again next game. Hey, let me know. I'm sitting there, and I, I go like this. I get up. I go, let me tell you something. ain't going to be a third time. <laughs> 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 Those guys, uh, homie, don't play that with them dudes. <laughs> so you kind of always knew where you were with you guys. Let me get to some bear talk, Coach. Is it Caleb? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I, I and I, I don't have any – insight but it sounds like it is it sounds like um uh you know that he was in for his visit here they had been out to california on a social visit they were at his pro day they spent a lot of time with him at the combine so i i think that they feel like they've done their homework uh you know ryan poles the gm there uh you know, they, they, I know they wanted a quarterback, you know, I mean, keep in mind, Ryan Poles was an assistant GM, a pro guy at Kansas city when the chiefs drafted Patrick Mahomes. So his vision of a quarterback is not just a drop back guy, a Michael Penick say at Washington, it, it's a great passer. He, you know, he, he wants a guy that can ad lib and can do some magical things. And, and that's what Caleb's done now. You know, he's, didn't have a great year last year, but either did Drake May. And, you know, so, I mean, that, that happens. The guy's got a lot of talent. Uh, he's been, he's, you know, the media here in Chicago can beat you up. The, the biggest thing that he's going to have to do is when he gets here, uh, and this is what I really admired about Justin Fields. Uh, you know, the, I remember seeing Justin Fields standing at that podium in December. It was probably wind chill at Soldier Field about 
15 degrees. He had a separated shoulder. And the media said, well, how's your shoulder going to be? You know, big game next week. And he says, I'll be ready. And he went out and played. I mean, you better be Chicago tough. And this is in L.A. This is Southern California, as you know, Dan. You better be smoking cigars and, and, and drinking red wine and eating steaks in this time. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's just the mentality of these people. It's a, we use the expression blue collar time. Well, Chicago is that. And, and they know their football and they appreciate it. And um, so he's going to have to be, uh, you know, there's nobody going to be babying him here. He's going to have to come in and toughen up. If he can do that, uh, he's got all the skill, and they are building a supporting cast around him that's pretty darn good, pretty good. Okay, well, all I'll say is this. Better throw 35 touchdowns and four grand with pink fingernails in Chicago because <laughs> I'll tell you what, man, I'll, I'll say this. That'll become a – if he throws for four grand and he has 30 touchdowns and pink fingernails, that'll become a fad in Chicago. <laughs> if he doesn't, they're going to go off on that guy because – that ain't a city because, like you said, you freeze your baguettes off there in June. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got about two months. It's like Alaska, northern lights up there, man. I mean, hey, speaking I, of Justin Fields. I, I, coach, hey, Danny, Danny, I remember my first bad my, – when I first became the head coach of the Bears and we were playing our first – really cold weather it was going to be the wind chill was uh you know it, it was going to be in the teens 10 degrees out or something and that wind was blowing off the lake and we're in there and I'm looking for my long underwear and stuff you know and coming from Dallas and we're going out to warm up and Richard Dent and Steve McMichael and these guys all they're doing is putting Vaseline all on their arms and they got no thermals on their sleeves are cut up to the top of their thing and i i grabbed steve mcmichael and i said ming i says what are you, are you guys gonna it's 10 degrees out there he says well we just put this vaseline on to make sure our skin just doesn't split on us out there but we don't wear anything here in chicago coach and they went out there and they played that damn game and it, it and i tell you what i was tony wise had his coat on and he was taking his coat off he was scared to death that Dent or somebody was going to roll the fridge was going to come up to him and rip his coat off him. <laughs> hey, all I remember, Coach, is that when we went up to like Pittsburgh and Cincinnati and places like that, the Miami guys would never been north of the, <laughs> of the state line. And these guys are sitting here on, and I'm going like, man, it's going to be a tough game for the defense. And Coach is going to go nuts on us, man. <laughs> they, they run on us, man. Holy cow, man. I never played with a bunch of guys in my life that always look and go, what's the temperature? And yeah. I'd always lie to them. Oh, it's 47. No, man, it's 37. <laughs> we yeah, always was, had to worry about the weather, didn't we, coach? I was just, I was always nervous that they, as long as the guys got off the bus, I said, we got a chance. <laughs> hey, this is a cold one here. Coach, do you think they did enough for Justin Fields? They now bring in Keenan Allen. As you said, DJ Moore, they, they've really put a football team, and it looks like they'll probably do something there at 9-2, um, either defensively with Turner or potentially maybe even Bowers. I don't know. Um, yeah. You, you did know they what? do enough for Justin? Yeah, you know, I, I, I always look at quarterbacks this way. You're down by 10. There's six minutes to go in the game. Do you have a quarterback that can take you down the field twice when you have to throw it, they know you're going to throw it, and score twice and win the game? That's what separates – I mean, could Justin Fields have got him to the playoffs this year? I think he could have. I mean, you know, he got hurt. He missed four games last year. So you think Pittsburgh got a good deal? Well, no, listen to what I'm saying. His fourth quarter stats were terrible. He was last – since he has been in the NFL, if you look, look up Justin Fields' fourth quarter statistics, and in the fourth quarter, Danny, he was last in completion, last in interceptions. He was at the bottom in almost everything. Wow. And I think there was one game in his whole career that he came back and, we, and the Bears scored a field goal to win the game. So that's what was kind of missing. When he, when you can play action him and you can boot him and waggle him and move him, 
and he can do a little bit of you know, quarterback run or you know RPO, all that stuff. The guy's as good as anybody. But when you're behind and you got to throw the ball, he just that just never happened for him. And you know, Matt Eberflus, when he said that at the combine, because there was a lot of discussion after the season: were they going to keep him? Were they not? What were they going to do? Because there was a strong sentiment on the team and with fans to keep Justin Fields. He's, he, and I know the coaches up there very well. This guy's in early and he stays late. He is tough and he will work his tail off. So, you know, the intangibles are A+. plus. So there was a lot of discussion back and forth. And Matt Eberflus at the Combine made this statement. Well, you know, you always need to be looking at quarterbacks and what they do in the fourth quarter. The minute he said that, Everybody in Chicago was on that internet looking at fourth quarter statistics. And when they saw what I just told you about Justin, they knew that the Bears were moving on. Two last questions for you, Coach. You mentioned Eberflus. Is he the right guy? And tell me why he's the right guy, because he's a defensive-minded guy. They're making all these offensive moves. I'm not saying defensive guys. I mean, look at Belichick and Carroll and Vrabel and all these guys. There's no question. I think the league is getting away from you guys being the head guy, and they're going more to these inexperienced analytical dudes, which I'm not a fan of. However, who is he, Coach, and is he the right guy in Chicago? You know, I, I, I'm a fan of Matt's, and I'll tell you why. Two things. One, I've been to several – I've been to their OTAs. I've been to their training camp practices, and – it's about as close to a college practice tempo as you're going to see. There are nobody sitting on any helmets at the Bears. They are moving from drill to drill. You know, he spent a lot of time coaching in college. Huh. And, and uh, he uh, – and then I think when the guy took over the defense, I mean, they went from bottom five to ten to top ten. And he completely – won those defensive players over. And I think that part of him coming back this year, I think that ownership got him and said, listen, if we bring you back, how do you, where are we at on our defense? And I think he said, you bring me back, I'll hire a defense coordinator, but I will call the defenses again. And that's a big deal. He did a great job of it. He really did. If you look at the draft coach at nine, trade down, corner, edge, OT. What's the biggest need? I don't know what edge is. I think somebody canceled defensive end. I still call him <laughs> defensive I still, end. <laughs> I, I still call him defensive end. <laughs> but no, in, in all seriousness, I would go. They need a, another pass rusher for sure. And the best pass rusher, in my and I've watched all these guys. You know, it, the best one in the draft, I think, is Latu, the guy from UCLA. UCLA. This guy's a player, but he's got the medical rep because he field his physical at Washington. And so he leaves Washington and goes to UCLA and they pass him. So that that's, you know, we're yeah. not anything about that. But I think he, I'm a big fan of his. And you know who else I like? The kid out of Florida State. Verse. Verse. Because this guy plays the run and the pass. Dallas Turner, I evaluate him. He's a great athlete. He can run like mad. He can bend. He can do those things. Watch him using his hands, taking on the run. He know Will Anderson. It's not happening. He's got to be out there in space. So if you want a guy that's going to line up on the edge of a tackle and take on a block, uh, I would go with Latu or I would go with Verse if on defense. And receiver-wise, you know, with Keenan Allen, you know, they got Allen, they got DJ Moore, they got two or three young guys. Could they use another receiver? Sure they could. You know, there's some great ones there. Uh, could they use another offensive lineman? Sure, they could. But I would look if I was the Bears. I would do everything I could if one of the if they like these two guys that I talked about, I would take one of them. Coach, finally here, let me say this to you. You know, someone asked me about the draft, and you know, I I, I put the draft guys down too. I'm like you. I like watching and looking at. I always thought you guys were the greatest talent evaluators of all time because you could look at a guy. And you could see all these great players. No matter if they're one star, two star, Cortez Kennedy, Russell Maryland, no star. You guys knew what you were looking at. And someone goes, why were they so good? I go, well, let me just say this to you. Those guys were so good at talent evaluating. You couldn't have any one of us put our game film on. You could have went to our practices. Because Barry Switzer, 
He was on last week. And Barry goes, you know what made you guys so good? I showed up at a practice. I couldn't believe what I was watching. I thought I was watching an everyday football game on a Saturday. You guys were playing football on a Tuesday, Saturday games on Tuesdays. I said this to coach. You could have drafted the first rounds and everyone would have probably went in their respected places if you just went off our practices. That's how intense they were. You could have drafted, couldn't you, coach? Oh, off yeah. our practices alone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It. Uh, and then I, you know, I, I laugh. Jimmy and I were talking about this all, a couple of weeks ago. We get done with practice, and you guys barely had a time for a shower. We met up in that room. The we, we, training table was already closed. We <laughs> says, "Go through there quick," and you throw some slop on a in a in a styrofoam container, <laughs> and we come down the hall with the defense. And the, you guys would be in that little room just packed in there. It was 100 degrees, sweating, eating out of a plastic container with a plastic fork. And we were watching ball film, getting ready. I mean, it was uh, – things have It changed. was a magical – Coach, what in a magical time? I mean – Wow. It's, it's, I, it, it was, that my defensive front four, Hawkins first rounder, Stubby was – would have been a first runner. I think he was the 30th pick. Jerome second, was yep. the ninth. I was the 56th player taken. As a junior, we had Kennedy and – uh, Maryland, all these guys behind us. I mean, our front seven were so insane. And like you said, it was the practicing. It was the coaching. I've never been involved in anything that was a perfect storm like that. And you know what, Coach, I say about you guys? I don't ever remember you guys ever being like this. You never were off the reservation. You demanded perfection, but it was always coaching. And I don't ever remember negative words like, you freaking that, never that it was always get your ass. Let we started out with pursuit drill, 30 minutes of it. But you know what? I tell people this, I go, you know why we're watching the Eagles and the Eagles have, and Ray Lewis is going like this. The Eagles have horrific pursuit angles. And he went like this. We'd be running for three hours yeah. at Miami because when, because we started that you and Butch and them would go first 35 minutes of practice would be pursuit. And here's you throwing the ball. We'd have to run to it. That's before practice even started. We would do that. We, that was the first drill. And that drill always stuck out in my mind on how you guys always looked at the little things. Crazy yeah. how that happened. Well, we knew how much talent that you guys had. And, you know, we, I, we just had to, and it started with Jimmy. We just, were going to try to do everything we could to get the most out of that talent, you know, and, and not let the, uh, Lot, not let the mo moment get past us, I guess you could say. Take advantage of it. It was really and we, and we were we were young and loved what we were doing and silly <laughs> and crazy, you know, and it was it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> man, it was totally fun, man. I'll never in my and by the way, one more coach, you guys have been the same, and I say this to Jimmy and Butch and Campo, you guys have been the same to me since I was 19 years old that I am right now at 60. Same. Yeah, it's crazy. You guys really believed in what you said, and you're the same people. You, well, I'm going to see Jimmy next week, okay? And then the, w during the draft, Tony Wise called. He's driving somewhere. He says, you're going to be in Chicago. I said, yeah. He says, How about, I'm going to stop in for about three or four days during the draft. So we'll we'll catch a couple uh, steak places. And, and so, I mean, yeah, so nothing's changed. We're still doing the same things. I love Coach Wise. You make sure I said hi to him. Make sure you tell him hi. Well, One do. of the truly great guys. Coach, thank you. All right, Danny. Good talking, buddy. You bet. Dave wants that. I love Coach, man. He he ran one of the absolutely best defenses in college football and in the National Football League, and it was a just absolute fun to play for him, man. It, it really was. And we were every year I was at UN, we were the number one ranked defense in the country. And those football teams did not like giving up touchdowns, first downs. Um, long runs. So when I'm a little bit, hey, hey, Yale, maybe this is why I'm a dick to the Eagles that they don't take that side. Per I take that side personally. Okay? I take that side personally. I take it running over personally. I take 140 yards rushing personally. You're not doing that to me. That's not happening. It's just, I'll kick you in the nuts. 
before that happened. That's not, I'll hit you with a chair in the head before you're going to run 140 yards on me. That's just not going to happen. I mean, we had that mentality. It's not going to happen. Nobody was going to do that. Scoring on us. When we, I don't care what the score was. We're up 40 nothing. We're sitting there going, I want the goose egg. I want the goose egg. I want the goose egg. Everyone's like, we're up 40 nothing. I'm not letting up on nothing. Get your ass out of here. Oh, my God. Me and Jerome threw many people out of the, lo- out of the hu- uh, huddle. Hey, dude, we're not having that. You're, you know, you're not, you're not taking, you're not taking, I'm not, I'm not coming out. We're good. <laughs> I used to throw my helmet, man. It was horrible. I was terrible. My aunt will tell you, I was terrible with that. Okay. Okay. And um, T. Will goes, you're such a dirty player. Oh, I know. So horrible. Big bad sales. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Sales, what, 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 were you a dirty player? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Would I step on offensive linemen's hands? Oh, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> I know you're kidding. <laughs> well, yeah. Foot on neck kind of guy. That's it. Absolutely, man. And that's the one thing your defense doesn't have. You know what? They don't have a set of baguettes to kill people. Step on their throats. Turn them into roadkill. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. Roadkill. Instead, you were the roadkill. You were L. You know what roadkill is? A-K-L. A-K-A L-J. Roadkill <laughs> or dick train. That's roadkill. Big seals, in my opinion, Nick Foles. Nick Files used wide receiver Alshon Jeffries like a wide receiver. Nick Foles. Whereas Wentz used him like a tight end. All right, Frank. Okay. It's a reflection of the soft ass coach and GM. Ugh. Um, you got guys that help the opponents up. <laughs> oh, hey, Sam, you had one of the best takes going. But Sam, I gotta tell you. Oh man, I would never shake hand. Dude, it, it, Sam, this, I, I, I'm I I only time I ever did this. Okay. Only time. That's because players are getting fined for touching a quarterback wrong these days. It's a different NFL sales. Chris, you're right. So we got beat in a title game by Penn State. And the offensive line, Steve Wisniewski, we beat them. We beat the monsters. Me and Jerome are sitting there. I'm not shaking their fucking hands. Jerome goes over and shakes his hand. And Wisniewski comes walking over to me. Hey, I'm going to shake your hand. You guys are as good as Millen and Clark, like Coach Paterno said. Yeah. I, 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 when he said that, and the center and uh, Schaefer and Dozier, and then the offensive line coach came over to me and Jerome, best people I've ever seen. And I'm going, <sighs> I shook the hand, and I was like, man, I'm walking off the field. I was like, I never done that. But they they were like, you guys, it's incredible. It was incredible. The, the offensive line coach, the head coach came over. First thing they did was shake me and Jerome's hand. I've never seen anything like that. You give up only seven first downs. You had seven turnovers. And you lose. Gave up 100 yards of total offense. And we were like this. We couldn't have played any better. Me and them had 22 tackles apiece, three sacks. And we were like this when we lost. Jerome goes, we lost. I said, I couldn't. I never got over it. We're walking off the field and all the coaches come over to us from Penn State. And they were like, man, unbelievable. Unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that. And we were like, didn't make you feel good at the time, though, still, because you lost. But in retrospect, I guess it was. And we were like this. 
100 million people watched us. And we were like, God. And I told you guys a story. I'm in the airport with Joe Paterno. Puts his arm around me. He goes, two best defensive tackles I've ever seen. And I had two of the best. Matt Millen and Bruce Clark. Best I've ever seen. And I'm like, coach. He goes like this. I hear it's your birthday. And I go, <laughs> it is. He goes, well, I wish you came to Penn State. He, Why didn't you come to Penn State? I go, it's the shoes. <laughs> he went like this. The shoes. I go, my grandfather loved you, man. You look like my Uncle Bucky. And he was like, what do you want? He goes, I didn't know this. I go, when well, you were walking into Catholic High, you were walking into Catholic High, and I went, my Uncle Bucky's here? And Tony Brown, who went to Pitt, goes like this. He goes, is that your Uncle Bucky? I said, no, it's Joe Paterno. He goes like this. He points at me. I go like this. I thought he was pointing to Tony. Tony was a six seven offensive lineman at Catholic High. And yell, I'm going like, he goes, you. And I, I sat down with him, and he's like, yeah, I'm here. For, I go, yeah. He goes, we'd like you to come to Penn State. And I'm like, I, you don't have your name on the back of the jersey. <laughs> yeah. And you you wear black shoes. He's like, what? <laughs> and it, it, it sparked the conversation we had. He goes, oh, yeah. I remember you were more concerned about the spot built shoes. Yeah, hey, yeah, they had they wore spot built shoes. And I was like, <laughs> and no names. And I was like, yeah, you know, my folks back east can't see me. Steve, thank you. Can't wait till we're rolling next year to see you recant this whole offseason. Shit's gonna be glorious, Daniel Son will be your new handle. Shout to the group and dick train. Y'all be safe. Daniel, son. Hey, Steve, this just in, my good dear friend with the wrench. I wasn't wrong at all last year, my friend. I said you were going nowhere. I just didn't realize that you would have the glorious BJ, absolute meltdown. LJ, if I'm a cancer, you're diabetes. Ooh, sticks and stones, dickhead, will make me stronger, but names will always hurt you, BJ. <laughs> Good old BJ. Shit, man. BJ makes me excited. <laughs> oh, man. Sills, you ever considered playing at Southern Cal? I did. It was too far away, Denny. Denny, you want to know truthfully what happened on my trip? Flexing, awesome. Get this. Hey, Denny, here's what happened on my trip. So who was the guy that was the athletic director there? His name was Yagi. I forget. Hey, hey, Yale. Who was the guy that was the athletic director back in the day in 85? Was it Tim? Was it Yagi? Yarga? I forget what it was. And... I went on a recruiting trip to Southern Cal. They took, they took me around. And uh, Mr. Miyagi. No, it wasn't Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> okay. No, it, no, Mr. Miyagi was not the athletic director at Southern Cal. Like in 82 or 3? 80, 80, 82. Would have been the time that I went on my trip. And when I got there, hey, the school was great looking. It, it was just great. But then there were gunshots. And one of them got through the uh, the screen that they have at Southern Cal. And I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. 
not going to be looking duck at bullets on a. And Gary Cobb went to Southern Cal. He went, and I, I was I was thinking about. I was thinking about big old Gary went there. You know, he went that far away, and Southern Cal was a massive power then too. Okay, yeah, SC's in the hood. It is in the hood. Still, when you get on campus, though, it's spectacular. It's, it's just spectacular school. Okay. So here's a riddle. What do the Eagles, Falcons, and Cowboys have in common? They are run like dog shit. <laughs> uh, so, <coughs> LJ Sills is a walking ad for a root beer. Sugar is bad for you. LJ is a walking condom. <laughs> He's a walking advertisement for a prophylactic. And why prophylactics should still be used? <laughs> LJ is a walking advertisement for a prophylactic. <laughs> ah, that'd be a condominium to you, BJ. <laughs> uh, it's all good, kid. Steve with the wrench. <laughs> <laughs> even, even yeah, look at it. LJ prophylactic. You you could you'd probably use it as a balloon or a, a water balloon. It's okay, son. Look it up. Google it. You might want to try one. <laughs> the world would be better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. Talking about the Trojans. Maybe that's how I got on it. All this rough talk makes me <laughs> miss Diddy Smooth. James, shut. What is that, James? I'm going to take a time out on that one. By the way, my good friend Chuck Todd's going to join us, the news director from NBC News. We're going to talk some sports with our dear friend. That's going to be at 530. We're looking forward to doing that. All right. Never change, big guy. How you doing? EQ and we're all good. Buy me dinner first, fat. So <laughs> I ain't that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, LJ, I don't need a prophylactic for you. <laughs> I'm taking a time out. My head's going to kill me. Hit, <laughs> hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Philadelphia fans were cut from a different cloth. Born into a brotherhood and bonded to our team for life. We believe anything is possible because we've witnessed the impossible. While we may be from different neighborhoods, come Sunday, we are one and we will be heard. Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online.
Mike Little was a union construction worker who was badly, badly injured when he suffered a horrific fall because of someone's negligence. His life would change forever. It was just a real downward spiral with everything. Everything you do, and you're sitting home by yourself all day. Have no, you know, you can't go out because you can't drive, you can't walk well. It was just a horrible situation. Call Brian Fritz at the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm at 215-548-2222. E-A-G-L-E-S Eagles Big Sales National Football Show Our good friend Chuck Todd The news director from NBC News Will join us What a crazy crazy political Year this is going to be He's a gigantic sports fan We'll talk a little OJ with him He knew him well uh, we'll talk some Caitlin Clark with him. He loves football. So we're going to talk and catch up with our good friend. Um, I can't believe Urban Liar is going to be involved with the Ohio State. And I'm glad to see that networks are broadcasting some of these spring games. You're going to get high ratings for that. Ohio State, any of the Southeastern Conference, Alabama. But Urban Liar... How did that guy get involved with television again? You put a piece of shit like that on the air. He is such an awful man. Man. He is such an awful dude, man. That guy's got no credibility. He lies about character. He just absolutely is somebody that you would... like. Sending my kid to him, never would I allow that guy to coach my kid. You know why? He The only thing he does different than Bobby Knight is he doesn't hit his players or he doesn't scream at them like he does. But Bob Knight will tell you about character and not have it himself. I mean, just, I don't get it. I just just don't get it. At least Bob Knight. Okay, I mean, Bob Knight told you to have character, and he didn't have any with his own personal life. I want you to be this. I want you to be that. Respect this. Go to school. Get your grades. And then this guy's a piece of shit, too. You know, it's funny. I had John Wooden on my show when I was in Tampa, and I asked him, would you ever send your kid to Bob Knight? He goes, never. That's not the way I coach. You know what Bob Knight turned around and said? Must be nice to have Sam Gilbert. John Wooden will never get away from that. Wooden paid for paid for talent. Bob Knight didn't. And there lies the difference in the conflict between the two men. Bob Knight always said, and this is one of the reasons Tarkanian was in the bullseye of the NCAA because everyone knew what Sam Gilbert was doing. They were buying players for UCLA. I mean... He was the big booster at UCLA, Papa G. And everyone knew it. That's how they got all. How do you think you got Jabbar to go for Power Memorial from the East Coast to UCLA? What, because Jackie Robinson went there? Come on, man. (laughs) Come on, man. Here are. Oh, wait. No, he's passed on Bob Knight. Yeah, Parcells was friends with Bob Knight. Um, Actually, if I'm not mistaken, Barb, I think Parcells coached at Army when Bob Knight was at Army and Coach K played for him. Okay? I think, I think that's how that was. All right. So now it's picking up steam. Sam, are you still in here? Sam, you started something. I think it was you, Sam. By the way, thank you guys very much today. You guys have been over generous, man. Even uh, BJ has been kind of like, you know, good. Okay? But a lot of you guys, awesome, man. Uh, Big Marshall, too, on, on the comeback. Got his wrench back and everything. So he's starting to hit everybody over the head with him now. Oh, good. Um, So it's now picking up steam here, my friend. 
Hey, Ty. Looks like A.J. Brown's going to get his little panties in a bind when they give Devontae Smith his bag of money. Oh, no. Oh, no. The Cookie Monster's coming. Oh, no. Oh, no. You mean, why does Devontae get more money than me? I've outperformed him. I'm the better player. Why is he getting more money than me? I'm holding out. I'm taking my panties and my bat and ball, and I'm going to sit over here until I get my way. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> and that's how I see him doing it. Damn it. Devante can't. He can't make more money than me. I've been more productive. You know that's coming. Oh, my God. Lord a football. Got to just, you know, you got, I don't believe in polytheism, but the Lord of football, please. My heavenly Lord of football, please give Devontae Smith a four year, $110 million deal. Please. God, God of football, I so trust a big salesman. <laughs> oh, please, please, Lord of football, give him the money. Show me the money. Amen. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Yes, sir, baby. That guy's going to be like, how come you get all your money and I don't get the money? How come I'm the guy to make another play and I'm the guy that the better the player? How come he gets all the money? He he Dude, so you want more you want more targets than him. You want more money than him. But he's next up. You want your contract redone? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, son. <laughs> Jesus, Gravity. Is this a nursery school or is this a football team? <laughs> is it a... Hey, hey. Is this a nursery school? AJ would be right. AJ would be right, though, to, hey, honor your contract. I thought I heard people in here telling um, Hassan Reddick to honor his contract. Honor your contract. He had two more years left. Yeah, but I can't have him make more money than me. Because that means he would have a bigger stick than me. <laughs> or bigger bat and ball than me. And I can't have the Trump one. And then, of course, you got Jalen over there in the moping corner. Well, I don't know what to do. What should I do? And then, of course, you have the wandering fool, um, Nick Sirianni. Nick Sirianni walks around like Joe Biden. Hey, 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 wait a minute. Hey, hey, big marshal. Here's Nick Sirianni on the, on the sidelines. Who does he remind you of? You got me. You want you? No. Um, yeah. Hey, President Harris. I mean, <laughs> hey, hit that guy with a wrench. <laughs> That's who Nick Sirianni coach is like. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> Reminded me of a host we had here. I got nothing for you. <laughs> Sills, that's why I want Smitty's deal done before the draft so we can trade AJ. Dude. That, I said it earlier, my friend. Why haven't they just exercised the fifth-year option? What are they holding him back for? Why not just exercise it? You have that autonomy to do it. What's your holdup? And by the way, I wouldn't think Devontae would be too pissed off at that. Here's why. Um, you, you're on a contract, and you want to see what the market – you don't even know what the market is. You, hey, get this. 
is this is this fair to say? Hey, Ty. Ty, you don't agree with this move, but let me ask you something. If you're Def- if you're Devontae, would it would you not agree? It's not a given Nick Sirianni's back next year as head coach. Right? It's not a given. It's not a given. Wouldn't you want to know who your coach was? And, and it's not a given Kellen Moore's back. Yeah, but Ty, why would you sign an extension at a place you're not sure about? You're kind of sure about the quarterback, okay? You're not sure about the coach, and you're not sure about the coordinator. And you don't know what the market is. Why would you want to sign an extension if it's less than market value? Now, if you want to pay me $25 million, then we're having a different conversation here. Four years, 25? All right. Let's sit down and talk. Four years, 20? That's the deal that AJ signed three years ago. Why would you give me an undermarket deal? Oh, you think lesser of me? Well, let me go see what my value is in the open market. Here, here's what they're battling. Yale, yeah, here's what they're battling. Not upsetting AJ and not insulting Devontae. Does that make sense? I don't think they want to insult Devontae. But with AJ, it's more about upsetting. Dude, if they give that guy one dime more. Now, look. If it's 22 over 20, I don't know. Maybe A.J. wouldn't cry about it, especially if he puts up another great 1,400-yard year. The Eagles would probably re- – hey, and, and who brought this up too? They may restructure. Uh, hey, but here's my problem again. Why are you doing all this work on offense when the priority has to be addressing the defense? You're not doing anything. I'm really glad to hear what Dave said. <laughs> and I'm talking Dave wants that. When he said, Vic's a good coach. And I trust Dave's opinion. Okay, I do. I, I trust his opinion a lot. He goes, look, Vic Fangio's a no shit guy. And all those coaches that he brought in, those are his guys. And it, you know, Dave's got a lot of confidence. He's got a, he's got a lot of confidence in what Vic Fangio. Okay. A lot of confidence. Okay. Um, give him lifetime changing money up front, restructure the contract of AJ. So you drop the cap hit makes, Hey, by the way, but Yale, remember this. If you restructure, guys, if you restructure that AJ deal, don't you make it easier to move him next year if you do that? If you're the agent, are you open to doing that? Are you open to doing that? Because if you lower that cap hit for next year, it makes it easier for the Eagles to go, I'm out. Now, me personally, as long as I'm making, I'm not making any less money, but you want to give me more money of the cap hit up front and you want to put it in my pocket, I'm probably going to take it. But it makes it easier and it signs your, I think it signs your death warrant that you're not going to be an eagle after next year. Okay. If you give the, if you get, If you let the club get off the hook, see, they may entertain it more moving him right now, but they can't because of what LJ says, the cap hit. Still, my big thing right now is, why haven't they exercised the May 2nd fifth-year option? Are they thinking of moving him? Are they fielding calls about him? 
You think teams are fielding calls or calling the Eagles about Devontae, knowing full well that they're not going to pay two wide receivers at $20 million? Or AJ open? Is it so that the reason that they haven't signed that fifth-year option is because if they do move AJ, they want to give Devontae a contract extension? Let me say this to you. If they give AJ Brown or if they give Devontae Smith a contract extension, I think that could be more of of a sign that they're open to moving AJ Brown and eating the cap hit because of the cap space they do have. Okay. I mean, they got so much work though to do on defense. How much would it would the hit be if they're willing to hit 66 million for Wentz? I didn't think it was 66. I thought it was 36 for Wentz. I have to imagine they would do it for Brown. I think Brown's is around that 30 something number too. Okay, I think they're around that number. Okay. Um, They're trying to get a deal done before Jefferson and Chase. Yeah, but Chris, why would I do that if I'm Devontae? Why would I do that? LJ's right on the cap hit. Again, because our quarterback's cap hit is low, so we can afford both. Um. They're not going to do that, though. They need that money and that equity on the other side of the... Why aren't they spending money on defense then? And and, and for the record, why haven't they picked up the option then? Or why haven't they gone ahead and given him a contract extension? Why would Devontae, why would Devontae Smith sign that? LJ's making no sense. It's not the point that they can afford it. Why would he do it? You're not sure who your coach is. You're not sure who your coordinator is. You don't even know what the market is. And you want me to take $5 million less? And you want to offer me a contract that was three years old? Forget it. Why would I do that? Because you're the Eagles? Blow me. Honestly. Not happening. That's what I would tell my agent. Casey showed you they don't need to spend huge at every position defensively. (laughs) Are you under the impression that you have a good defense like them? They actually hit on their draft picks. They can move off a Sneed. Obviously, you're not looking at how the uh, Kansas City Chiefs are built. They're built with a spectacular coordinator with guys who hit on draft picks. You don't hit on draft picks. Don't use the equity at all. Building a building a team is one of the absolutely most important things that you ha- can ever understand when it comes to equity of a rookie contract. Before I get Chuck on here, I just want to finish this, this point up. When you miss on a draft pick, it's not so much you miss on the pick, you miss on the rookie equity. You understand that? You miss on the rookie equity of three years not spent. Devontae Smith, I was going to spend three, uh, $9 million on. A.J. Brown, I'm going to spend 60 of the money you could have spent on defense. Got to spread the cap around. Hey, guess what? The Eagles spend money like our government spends it. <laughs> uh, hey, we'll just write another check. Who cares? We'll pay it down the line. We'll do something Fannie Mae. We're ready to roll here. Let's get Chuck Todd. Who I don't know, man. Is Todd more now in retirement, semi-retirement? Uh, I mean, I've got the polo shirt. I got the golf shirt to 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 make it look retiree. Figured I'd look like one. <laughs> I was semi-retirement. I know it's a big year now. Uh, the landscape. I, I'm very doing? I'm I'm very busy. It's it's nice to it's nice to be in control of my own schedule. I'm busy enough. Do you miss me the press? I miss some of the interviews on Sundays. I just don't miss Monday through Saturday. You know, <laughs> Hold on, wait. I mean, now you sound like an NFL guy. I, 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 was, it, I just realized I sounded just like, and I, I didn't mean to, but Sundays are days that we, you know, that's when people saw you work. But the real work, I mean, it's just like you would say about playing on the field. 
all the work was Monday through Saturday. Sunday was the easiest day of the week. Absolutely, you know, man. I mean, Absolutely. in a weird way. Now you were putting yourself in harm's way, you know, me rhetorically, you physically, but it was in some ways the easiest day of the week. Um, Chuck, I've seen some of those meet the presses. I think you were put in harm's way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, brother. Uh, a lot, a lot more than you think. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm here. I'm still around. You know, bloody nose. I'll take it. You know. Let me go into this. What do you think? With the, I want to get into OJ Simpson a little bit here. I don't know how much you knew him. Obviously, he's an NBC former NBC employee. I know Bob we didn't cross. Yeah, well. we didn't cross paths, but yeah, Bob did, and I know Bob pretty well. Bob knew him very well. Worked with him, yes, obviously. Um, how much did the media change, first and foremost, oh my God. from that from that trial to where I, we see I, today? You know, Sills, I, I I look at it. It's almost like the Biff timeline in Back to the Future Two, like. I think we are an entirely different culture, an entirely different media, if OJ never kills his wife. The single, with the decision, when, when, look, you know, I, I look at, I, I look at various entities have lost trust with the public at various different times. And there's sometimes there's some big moments and small moments. Government has lost a little bit of trust. It, you know, JFK was a moment. Vietnam was a moment. Not finding WMD, the, the you know, financial crisis. Wall Street lost trust. Financial crisis, things like that. I think when the media, when CNN, and remember, they were the only game in town back in 1994. Yep. Um, the first week of coverage, it deserved to be holy ass. I mean, you know, I, I. You know, my son's 17, and I made him watch that 30 for 30 last night, the the one, the, the one on June 17th, the craziest day. Because I told him, I said, you know, you're going to think this sounds crazy, but I'm curious if you think the same thing, Celia. Um, 9-11's the, the, the biggest thing, you know, the most monumental thing that has happened in my lifetime, and I think you'd probably say the same thing. Modern day Pearl Harbor, but on our right. front. Oh, no, right. We saw it. We were here. We lived through it. You know, when we're 100 years old and they're asking us, what's the five biggest events you've lived through in your life? Number two might be OJ for me. Yeah. You know, it is. I don't think if you didn't live through it, I, I'm teaching a class um, um, how Washington works and college students here. Um, and last night I was trying to convey it and I realized none of them were alive. I'm sitting here telling them we only had one cable channel, but because of OJ, it it told people there was a business in that news could be a business. And before 1994, it was sort of like those moment, like in college sports, when all of a sudden you realize, oh, it's a business. And that was the moment you went, oh, you can make the news more compelling. Therefore, you can make more money on news. And so the way I look at the OJ moment, when CNN decided that they were going to prioritize the trial over everything else in the world. Everything else in the world. Yeah. You would you, you have sent a message that, okay, we, we, we understand we are going to let you, the audience, be our managing editors. You've told us you prefer to watch this than us to tell you, hey, let me tell you about war in Central Europe. That's what was happening at the time. You had Bosnia, Kosovo, and all that stuff. You know, let me tell you about what's going on with, you know, Saddam Hussein or nope. We're gonna we're gonna let the audience tell you what you what you want us to cover. If you think about it, it was the first time that we catered to the audience in the news business. And this is to me something that look, you do need to cater to an audience somewhat in order to get them to come listen to you, right? It, maybe it's a fan base, maybe it's a a knowledge base, something like that. But when you're in the supposed straight news business, part of your job is to sometimes, hey, I gotta, sorry, I gotta report what you don't want to hear. Because that's I've got to tell you everything that's going on. And that's the way I feel about the OJ. It was a moment where, where everybody in journalism had to follow the, the dollar and follow the audience. And I don't think we realized that's what we were doing in the moment. But right after OJ, if you think about it, Dan, every way we've covered...
because we wove right from OJ to Monica Lewinsky, the 2000 election to 9-11 to the Iraq war, which we embedded journalists so you could watch it as if it was a movie and you're watching like Halo. Like if you think about it, we've been sort of this sort of narrative driven mindset, sort of create news that's compelling to the audience. Um, and I don't think we're the better for it. I just don't, but it's too late. This is the world we live in now. Chuck, don't you think, and I'm going to expand into this, don't you think that's led us to Trump? And that Trump is good for news business? That whether, and again, I'm not making a political statement on what side of the aisle you're rooting for, but Trump is good for business because he's polarizing and he's content. And all the things that we've done, hasn't he... And that OJ moment led to this coverage. Dan, I if you you may be able to hear me, I can't hear you. For some reason, I've Can lost you all now? your audio. You, you got wanna... me now? Let's see, let's see if we can reconnect here a little bit here. Cause I want I want to I want to get back to that. Because I Chuck is Chuck and I have been friends <clears throat> for like 35 years. And he and I have different opinions on many things, as you guys can obviously see. But all those things from OJ, and let's let we're gonna we're gonna bring Chuck right. back up. Here we go. Hey, sorry, Chuck, that was crazy. I hope you. I'm worried this, now how, that I dropped. Yeah. How about this? All the things that you just said hasn't that led us to Donald Trump, and that Trump I, is the good for business? Yeah, it's the celebrification. It's sort of the merging of politics, celebrity. Our culture did it. And here's the thing. It's possible that with the invention of social media, had we not gone down this road earlier, we would eventually maybe be here. I, I'm not going to, I don't that naive about it, but I'll tell you, you want to know how it turned into a business. Again, CNN, OJ, um, there's a good story about this earlier today. The major networks, it was the first time the broadcast news lost money because everybody was watching CNN. So what, what did NBC and Fox do a year after the O.J. Simpson trial? They started their own cable news channels. Did they do it because they thought we needed more news or did they do it because they thought it was a good business decision? Look, I, I, this is, and then when we went to this sort of find your own audience, well, then we have fractured ourselves, right? This is, you ask, why do we have all these different realities? We're a very fractured society. The only thing that brings us together is sports. Yep. It is the only thing that does. It's it's why I enjoy our conversations. I know that you see it as an opportunity, and I see it as an opportunity for both of us to widen our apertures and make sure that we remind people we're three dimensional human beings. Absolutely. Here now, let me let me roll back on OJ here for a second. Here, mm. I had Steve Tasker on, who was a Buffalo Bill legend, and I asked him, "Is it possible to separate the two? Where you mm. do this greatest?" One of the top five, maybe the second greatest running back to Jim Brown in pro football history. Yeah. Then you come up with this man where he's after his life, he went from the most respected man to the most reviled man. Costa said this. Yeah. And you're like, can you do both, Chuck? Or do you think you have to talk about the entire book? Look, I, I'm... I want to. I, I I say this as a sort of a his history junkie or, or news junkie, whatever you want to call it. I want to know everything, but I compartment. Let me compartmentalize it, and I will. I'll sit here and say, "Hey, this person, he's fantastic. Ty Cobb was amazing. He was also a racist, but he was amazing. Like I could do. Okay, it's like not a. I don't think that's difficult, and we should treat people like grownups. But I want to introduce another thing on OJ that we didn't know about in 1994 and 95, that you and, and all your uh, fellow football players now know today, is we don't know how harmful CTE is, when it kicks in, um, what it does. And I, look, we don't know that he didn't have a filter anymore, that he had triggered, you know, I, I did he just snap? Yeah, you hear about the people that snap. Well, did he have so many, you know, you get so many head injuries, does it mean you, you, when you lose it, you lose it too quickly and you can't stop yourself. You know, for all we know, he was going to go over there and threaten her or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to make excuses for him, but it's, it's possible he was mentally ill. Chuck, I, here, here's my problem with him. I've had dinner with him. I've mm -hmm. golfed with him. 
And even after the trial at the Palm restaurant in Orlando, my wife got up and left. She goes, I'm not sitting here with him coming over. And I sat down and second question he asked me was, you think I did it? And I go, yeah. I said, and he goes, does he do that? Wow. That's, that's, that's interesting, which tells you he knows he did it. Yeah, I know. And I thought it was was kind of a weird confession. Yeah. Wow. It was the third thing. We're at the Palm restaurant. Michael Martin set it up for us. I'm sitting there. My wife goes like this. I'm not sitting here. That's not yeah. happening. And so, I, I, you know, and she goes, this is your friend. I go, he's not mine. I didn't speak to him uh, after that. Friend, yeah, but friend's I a weird went, thing to say. But what like, was what weird you... about it, though, Chuck, I didn't believe he did it until the very end. Interesting. Because I didn't want to believe it. That's the – none of us did. A lot of I people didn't, didn't want to believe it. Didn't That's your childhood I, where you watch this guy go for two grand and all yeah. that, and you're like, he can't be that guy. He gets every chick on the planet. He can't the coolest be guy, that guy. Coolest guy on the planet. He was the coolest guy. He was one guy. of the first pitch men, and then you're yeah. like this. He did it. Holy cow. I can't believe uh, this. I was trying to explain to my son. Like, look, he only knows OJ as this sort of the the the, the pariah version of him, right? And I said, this is the equivalent of, I hesitate to t- say a name because it's not, you know, like basically Peyton Manning, okay, yeah. do, doing something like, you should be like, I don't believe it. It cannot be true. No, I oh, mean, and th- that's how we thought about OJ. Right, right. And it's just like, that's the point. Everybody loved him and you, refer- and you weren't allowed to not like him. In fact, yeah. there was like, something's wrong with you if you didn't like OJ. Now, you know, it turns out OJ had a, a dark side that was much deeper, much longer. We learned all of these things. And that, and that's on us sometimes, right? You know, sometimes you don't want to know about your heroes. I, I hate it when sports, as I love, run for office. Not because I don't think they should run for office, but I'm like, oh, man, now they're going to become polarizing. And I just, I don't want to have the conversation about, like, you know, I grew up idolizing Steve Garvey. And I knew some people that were, I was like, he's not going to win. What's he doing? He's just going to end up alienating people that love the guy. And he's, and go call, ask Herschel Walker if he, if he regrets running for office, you know, it's like, sometimes don't do it. If, if, if you really, if you're just doing it for a, you know, just because you're bored. Chuck, <laughs> do you think that that case resulted in the decision that was made because of Rodney King and some of the things that were done? In Los Angeles I, at the time, it. I mean, do I think that? I mean, I I think that OJ made in America, right? The five part series that ESPN did. Um, when you watch episode one, which is all about L- the LAPD in the nineteen sixties, right? And you realize, and and it went through, and then I mean, can you imagine? I've always thought about this moment: Marsha Clark and Chris Darden and Bill Garcetti. And they find out that the first cop on the scene is Mark Furman, oh. right? Like they know it. Like, oh, sh- they can now. They now like they, they they have a legitimate reason to put the LAPD on trial. Like it was like one of those. You're like, oh my god. And you know, you and I both know how bureaucracies work, right? Here's a guy, member of the police union. He they they probably couldn't fire him, so they where, where can we put him and where he's the least possible? To, let's have him patrol Brentwood. Nothing happens there, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it was sort of like, this is the way they all protect each other. We're not going to fire the guy, but let's make sure, you know, we're certainly not going to, we're not going to have him um, patrol USC, you know, and, 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 and Compton and put. You almost can picture how bureaucracy worked back then in the LAPD. And then they end up with that. And it was basically a gift to the, to the, it, look, yeah, I, I said this to these students last night. The 1995 version of me couldn't believe OJ was found not guilty. After I watched OJ Made in America, I was like, I get it. I understand yeah. it. And, you know, my favorite Dang. moment of that, Doc, is the older, that old lady, that old lady juror. And she goes, you know, look, we gave him one chance. Basically, she's like, we all knew he was guilty, but we decided to send a message, you know, to the LAPD. But I feel no sympathy for him that he's in jail now. Because remember, at the time he was in jail, it was just, it was an interesting. It was sort of like we weren't doing you a favor. We were we were going after LAPD. Don't mistake the two, OJ. I want to get into something here also with you with Caitlin Clark. 
Have you been same thing again? Have you been surprised, Chuck, with the outpouring of Caitlin Clark? Let's see if we can reconnect here a little bit here. Hopefully, I'd like to finish up this conversation. God, he's so good, man. No, 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 he's still the news director, by the way, at NBC News. So hopefully we can still connect here with him again because I want to I want to get back into this here. Thank hey, all right, Chuck. I want to get into can you hear me? Yep, yep. I did it Clark. again, but I, I figured it out. I get out got it in and got out fast, I think. Caitlin Clark, have you yeah. been surprised with the great outpouring of love? And also, have you been surprised with some of the negative stuff? that you've been hearing, which also makes her polarizing. Hey, Chuck, I can't, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Okay. Nope. Can't hear it yet. Nope. Can't hear you. Let's try it again. <laughs> this guy works at NBC. You mean to tell me he can't figure this shit out? <laughs> Uh, I mean, you mean to tell me you 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 can't figure this out? You work at NBC News. You're on. You're covering. Hey, I hope this don't go down like this during the coverage of the uh, election this coming time here, man. Because this guy will be like, uh, <laughs> hey, and <laughs> be be a lot different here. Can you hear me, Chuck? I got you, and I All think right. I'm on a better Wi-Fi, so we're good. Caitlin Clark, or have you been yeah. surprised? No, look, I think I think the I think you're out again. Damn, damn! I thought we had it here. See, see if we can get reconnected one more time here. It's too bad, man, because you're right. Chuck's really good. Chuck, you can't hear me. Dang it, man. I can't hear. I can't hear him. All right. We'll do it one more time. We'll do it one last time here. Huh. Now let's get now. <laughs> Condemn the innocent. Oh, okay. Way to go. Way to go, Christopher Darden. <laughs> God, we got to, we, I got to hear. Are you got to be there? I hear you now, right All now, right. Dan. All right, I'll go. Well, hurry then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, look, I think that, look, we. it's 50 years since Title IX, right? Right. And it took two generations for athletic, for the athleticism, for more sports, more girls participating, more everything. And I think, you know, this last three years has been women's college basketball. Um, women's college softball gets better ratings than men's college baseball. That's moving up. Um, I, I think this is just, this is what Title IX did. It sort of, we said it was going to bring more girls into sports. And guess what? The more they play, the more interested they are in watching other girls play. And then the athleticism is catching up. It's very athletic. It's a much different game than it was 10 years ago. It's a lot different. 18 million people watch that thing compared to 14 million with the men. Which is insane, and I. But have but, I, but I tell you why. Do you know the UConn guys? No. Right. Look, we got three years to get to know the Iowa girls. We got three. You know, we knew the South Carolina girls. Yep. Like if you followed them, LSU. they stay. They stay in school three, four years, so these teams gel. No different than look, man. Mid eighties, Big East basketball. I grew up. In, I was in Miami, and yet I love Big East. Valley. It was great. Georgetown and Villanova, and you knew all those guys. Lou Carnesecca, he dressed like Kim Mulkey, right? Like you know, they were characters. <laughs> it is interesting how college men's college basketball looks like a factory workers. They're just sort of they're grinding them out, one in, one out. Okay, who's next? Their numbers. And there's there's just there's just it's more it's just more interesting. The girls' games right now just got more. Culturally interesting, more storylines. Coaches are, I don't, I, you know, it's, I think it's, you know, maybe it'll change that NIL. Well, actually, this could actually help men's basketball, and we'll have three, four-year teams again, maybe. Chuck, I'm going to go off the reservation here a little bit, and you reel me back in if it's not relevant here. Okay. Okay. 
How much do you think the conversation about transgender being involved in women's sports also brings, again, I'm not mm-hmm. saying to you whether it's good or I'm not, I'm not picking a side on it. I'm saying it's still a polarizing topic in this yeah. country. And what it also does, it brings more focus on what women's sports are doing. Well, I, I, I think I see where you're going, and I'll say this. It's probably uh, it's probably made some people want to really support women's sports, wanting That's women's right. sports. I, I, I get what you're saying, and if you think about it, think about culturally where you've really seen a surge of interest. It's been in the Midwest, right, where uh, there's culturally been a little bit of – Midwest of, South. Uh, that's right. A little discomfort. And look, I think, I certainly think express your ex, ex, expressing in this positive way is a, uh, is a net positive. Yeah, no, so I, 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 it's like a way, I said, it, it, you know, it's one of those things you can't, you probably can't even fully, some really? of them might be subconscious, you know, but I get, I take your point. Do you like NIL? Um, look, I wish, there was a way to do this better. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Super League idea. I think there's something there. At, at this point, look, it's sometimes it's kind of, it's, it's you remodel a house. Sometimes it's you remodel a house. Remodel. Right. Sometimes you remodel a house, and sometimes you knock it down and start from scratch. It huh. might be time to knock down the house. And if you want to save it. Look, here's the problem. And this goes to something that I think is about our entire culture right now, Dan. You know, SEC and the Big Ten are more interested in in securing their own place at the top of the heap. They're not thinking about the greater good of the game. No. And you want, you could be at the top of a smaller heap, or you're probably going to be at the top of a, I mean, the irony here is, I really believe this. I think they're leaving money on the table right now. You could you could extract more dollars if Georgia's media rights and Colorado State's media rights were being negotiated at the same time. You and I both know that. If the Jacksonville Jaguars media rights were had to negotiate on their own, or how about the AFC South on their own versus the NFC, <laughs> right? You know, the NFC, you know, East with Dallas and the Jack, like that. You you know, we all know how that would play out, right? And so it, it's obvious that. There's actually, in their own sort of weird greed, they're actually leaving money on the table for everybody. Finally here, Chuck. And you're kind of like removed from Meet the Press, but I know you're going to be involved with the upcoming election this year. Is this going to be the ugliest election? Is this going to be the most disappointing time to vote for somebody is this going to be? Uh, is this going to be a really ugly time in politics? Get out and get in. Hang on. Hey, are you there? Okay, let me see if I could just finish this last question up with him here. I'm um, sorry about the disconnections and this and that here, but I got to finish up with my friend because, hey guys, I think this is going to be as we get closer to November. Okay, my final question for Chuck. I have figured out the issue. If you want to, so your producer listens, it's notifications. Anytime my alarm or a notification goes off, it, it disrupts our connection. Um, last, last question. Do you think yeah. this will be the ugliest election in modern history? Yeah, but in fairness, Dan, I, I could say that every four years. <laughs> um, so it, that isn't it. I, I think I'll say this. I actually think a lot of. Very good. Chuck, I love you. My friend, I got you. It's all good. Hey, love you, man. All good. Very good. All good, my good friend. Love Chuck Todd. All right, let's take a quick time out. Keep it here at National Football Show. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. 
An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Philadelphia fans were cut from a different cloth. Born into a brotherhood and bonded to our team for life. We believe anything is possible because we've witnessed the impossible. While we may be from different neighborhoods, come Sunday, we are one and we will be heard. Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Mike Little was a union construction worker who was badly, badly injured when he suffered a horrific fall because of someone's negligence. His life would change forever. It was just a real downward spiral with everything. Everything you do, and you're sitting home by yourself all day. Have no, you know, you can't go out because you can't drive, you can't walk well. It was just a horrible situation. Call Brian Fritz at the Fritz & Beyond Cooley Law Firm at 215-548-2222. E-A-G-L-E-S Eagles Sorry, but I, my my comment about uh, Devante or AJ I'm sorry, but you guys are crying um, uh, Jacob is fielding more emails to fire me all because I said, you can't have both. Okay? Honestly, man, are you that weak? Let me see what they even wrote. You're going to create chaos if you extend Devontae Smith with A.J. Brown on the team. And then you're going to have infighting in the huddle. <laughs> and then... Your lack of leadership at quarterback position won't be able. I hadn't read this. Hang on. <laughs> ah, uh, I did say no, no. I did say this, <laughs> but it looks weird. Hold on here. H hang on. Now, it looks weird me reading it. Uh, hang on here. Wait a minute now. I got to read this one more time here. Just don't even know what he says. <laughs> hey, evidently, you're going to create chaos if you extend Devontae Smith with A.J. Brown on the team. Uh, yeah, I said that. <laughs> then you're going to have infighting in the huddle. Yeah, I, I, I believe I said that too. Um, and then you're going to have a lack of leadership at the quarterback position. Won't be able to handle it. I, I, yeah, I believe I said these things. <laughs> ah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I guess that's me. <laughs> this thing's only been posted. How long? How long has this thing been posted? Okay, for a little over an hour, and it's already got 20,000 views. All right. Okay. <laughs> I guess I did say it. Yeah, to be a little bit of infighting, if you give the black, 
in the outside. You give the Blatt his money. If you give the good guy his money, the Blatt's going to run in hot. Can't do it. Because I got to worry about the whoopee guy over here. Okay? Get this guy off. Get him off. He's no good. He hates my team. Oh, because of the great leadership you have, a quarterback. And uh, A.J. Owens. You know you know what Owens can do, though, right, Xander? He can always go over to WIP in the afternoon show. A.J. <sighs> Is everything okay? <laughs> Come here, honey. Lay your little feet down in Ed. <laughs> Is it all white? What do you need? Let us know. They gave him more money than me. I know, honey. A bit more productive. <laughs> I know. Life ain't fair. I know. <laughs> oh, my God. The guy makes $25 million and he's crying. It went well. I want to be one, boy. Because... I'm a way wow. Hey, <laughs> um, you know what? He's a little baby. So I'm going to talk to him like a baby. I can't make more money on me. You can't extend this guy because you're worried about a clown outside because this guy's going to be moaning and crying because you gave him more money. Oh, whoa, whoa. My work got on my we. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, yeah. Xander wants to do this. Hey, Sam. Thanks, man. You gave us a really way to good, a really good way to end. Sam, you gave us a really good ending to the week. I want to thank you. LJ doesn't bring shit to the show. Sam, you finished the week off strong for us. Big Marshall, welcome back, brother. All you wrench heads. That's the new thing. The Big Sills wrench heads. All good, man. Have a great weekend. Please hit the like button. Xander Joe, thank you. Two to six. Monday. We're getting closer to the draft. Absolutely. Catch you Monday. We'll see you on the flip side.